for me the um, uh, uh, side uh, to this um, um, uh, first uh, workshop of um, uh, work package uh, three uh, i will just um, uh, share some uh, uh, slides about uh, the project okay very nice so uh, just a short introduction uh, what is ai for media about uh, ai for media is a network of excellence and uh, the main uh, objective is uh, to research and uh, develop um, next generation AI technologies, uh, which can be applied uh, to the media uh, industry, supporting uh, our society and uh, democracy, and on the same time ensuring that uh, the European values of ethical and trustworthy AI are fully uh, taken into, into account. Uh, when we are mentioning um, uh, media, uh, what uh, is the, the main um, uh, focus uh, in our uh, uh, project? It is in general about information production and delivery with uh, an emphasis on multimedia content and the multimedia uh, collections. Uh, one of the main applications is the news and uh, journalism, including um, uh, fighting disinformation. Uh, and then other forms of uh, media like uh, social media, entertainment, uh, arts, uh, culture, and uh, creativity. And uh, what are the main uh, uh, pillars, let's say, the main uh, di uh, 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 directions in the uh, project? Uh, of course, uh, like we are doing uh, today, uh, research and innovation activities are among the main focus and uh, for example the uh, workshop today is uh, on um, a new learning um, uh, and, and uh, distributed uh, learning uh, techniques uh, which is the focus of um, uh, work package 3 in uh, the project and these uh, research and innovation uh, activities uh, are uh, supported by many other more horizontal ones like, uh, for example, uh, a media, uh, an AI uh, observatory, which is going to produce uh, white, white papers and uh, roadmaps and uh, studies in uh, the field. Um, they are going to be developed specific uh, use cases where the developed technologies are going to be applied and tested in a more real world uh, environment. There are going to be open calls providing funding to external partners in order to enhance uh, the uh, AI for um, uh, media base. Uh, there are going to be uh, training uh, activities to an AI doctoral academy, which is uh, active and uh, already uh, offering uh, courses. And you can visit uh, the special um, uh, dedicated site uh, for this uh, activity. And all this will result to a virtual center of uh, excellence on AI for media. The, the consortium is uh, nine universities, nine research centers, and uh, 12 industrial partners, but we uh, already have and uh, we are accepting uh, uh, associate pa part members as additional partners. And uh, we are part of um, uh, a group of projects, uh, European projects, which uh, are all uh, working uh, in uh, AI, uh, AI technologies in order uh, to uh, improve uh, the excellence of um, uh, AI in Europe. And I think this is um, uh, uh, the most important uh, slide for people who are not uh, already uh, partners or members in AI for media. You can visit our site and uh, uh, become an uh, associate uh, member. This way you can receive information earlier. Uh, you can uh, be informed um, uh, about uh, our activities like open calls, uh, the studies, and uh, uh, so on. And I would like to say that uh, today is only the first, uh, and uh, I wish uh, the best of success, uh, of, uh, of a series of technical workshops. There are going to be uh, uh, there are going to be more in the future. So, for example, by joining um, uh, the project as an associate member, or by following our uh, links uh, and um, uh, social network channels, you will be informed about this. And yes, this is it from my uh, side. Uh, my best uh, wishes uh, for a, a successful and constructive uh, workshop. 
uh, now, today, about um, uh, uh, new learning uh, paradigms and in the future, in the following uh, AI for Media uh, technical workshops. Okay, thank you, Yanis, for the introduction. Uh, um, we are going to have 11 presentations this morning, so uh, it's better. It's better start. <laughs> we have uh, 15, uh, almost 15. Uh, nine I have has uh, have nine presentation have 15 uh, minutes presentation and and uh, another two. They they are at 25 plus five uh, questions. So um, let me. Introduce the first speaker, which is Elisa Ricci from University of Trento. She will uh, talk about uh, deep domain adaptation. Good morning. Let me try to share my screen. So you see the screen? Yes. Yes. And I guess now you see all the presentation. Yes. Perfect. Okay, good morning. So I'm happy to be the first presentation of this uh, very interesting workshop. So today I will talk about deep domain adaptation and in particular, I will focus on one of our recent activities on the field that is the curriculum graph co-teaching for multi-target domain adaptation. This is a, a work that we are gonna present this year at CVPR in June. So for us, working in computer vision, uh, a domain shift uh, is a really a long-standing uh, problem. So uh, in domain shift, uh, the, the domain shift refers to the problem where we have a discrepancy in terms of visual appearance from the data we have available, a training set for which we have a notation and data that we will see during test time. So in particular, uh, in this example, for instance, uh, we will have uh, during training, uh, uh, images that are natural uh, real images uh, and their annotation but at test time we would like to test our neural network uh, on uh, images for instance derived from cartoons why this domain shift it's a uh, it's uh, a big problem it, uh, it's a big problem because it is ubiquitous so we find domain shift uh, in many different uh, applications and in many different tasks and many different settings for instance, we may have domain shift when we have uh, training and test data that are collected under different uh, time and environmental conditions. We also have domain shift uh, uh, in case uh, where training and test data correspond to data collected by different sensors. For instance, uh, here uh, you have uh, you want to train a pedestrian detector and you want to uh, train this on RGB images, but then you would like also to use it on the data that are collected from thermal cameras. Also, you may have domain shift, you want to train your neural network on synthetic data, but then you would like to deploy the system on real images. Similarly, you want to build your object detector and you want to use uh, images derived from CAD models uh, for the training, but then you would like to test this on real images. So you really have a lot of situation where you observe domain shift. How we are dealing with the domain shift? Uh, over the years, our community has developed a series uh, of uh, techniques that mostly fall under the name of unsupervised domain adaptation technique. In unsupervised domain adaptation, we have access to a um, source domain for which we have uh, labeled data, so we have annotation, but then we are interested in, in finding a model that works well on a target domain for which we have no annotation. So our interest is really to have a, a model that works well and generalized to the target domain. Which assumption we make? We make the assumption that um, we have a different marginal distribution between the source and the target domain, but we have a shared label space. As I said, over the years, uh, several techniques uh, and several deep learning methods have been proposed to deal with unsupervised domain adaptation. Uh, mostly, they can be categorized uh, in three groups. The first group refers to discrepancy-based methods. Uh, this method introduces uh, into the neural network uh, a loss that promotes some form of alignment between the features that are um, developed for the source data and for the target data. And typically, this alignment is realized by considering uh, uh, first and second order statistics derived from source and target features and pushing these statistics to match. Uh, then there are a category of adversarial-based method, and this adversarial-based method uh, typically consider uh, 
adversarial learning scheme or consider discriminators or consider uh, domain confusion losses, but the idea is uh, uh, to promote uh, the learning of domain agnostic features. And then a pixel based method uh, utilizes the power of uh, gamuts. And in, in particular, uh, one possibility will be to start from uh, labeled data from the source domain and uh, uh, transfer and, and modify these images to look like target data. In this way, you have supervision in the target uh, samples, in the fake target samples, and you can train a classifier. Uh, well, uh, uh, beside the, these uh, three categories of method, uh, many more methods have been developed uh, that also cannot be classified in this group. For instance, recently, uh, some technique based uh, on uh, auxiliary tasks to learn domain agnostic features uh, have been uh, developed and they are also very powerful. However, um, what uh, our community also discovered is that the assumption that we make uh, in uh, traditional single source, single target domain adaptation are quite unrealistic. In fact, uh, in many applications, we don't have uh, a single source and a single target domain. Also, the assumption that we have a shared label space between the source and the target is too restrictive in practice. So, for instance, uh, new families of technique consider the problem of uh, performing adaptation in case uh, where you don't have an overlapping label space between the source and the target. Therefore, methods for open set, partial and universal domain adaptation have emerged. Also, uh, other approaches uh, consider uh, not a single source and a single target domains, but consider multiple source or multiple target domains. In uh, this work, we are interested to the latter situation, so multi-target domain adaptation. So in uh, uh, multi-target domain adaptation, we have access to a single source domain for which we have annotation, but then we want to cope with domain shift in the case of multiple unlabeled target uh, domains. So we have uh, multiple domain shift that we need to solve all at once. Why this problem is relevant? This problem is relevant because, uh, as you may imagine, in several applications, uh, we don't have uh, only a single target data set, but we have uh, several target data set, and we would like to put the model that generalize to the, all these target data set. Another reason why this problem is very interesting and very relevant is the fact that the method that has been developed so far, they have a deep neural network that don't scale well when the number of, of target domain uh, grows. As you may imagine, this problem is more challenging than the single source, the single target domain, for the reason that you have to deal at the same time with multiple and varying domain shift. In some situations, you may also have a poor support between some target domain and the source, and you also need to be especially careful to the problem negative transfer, so of transferring knowledge when this knowledge is not relevant for the target domain. In order to deal with more this uh, challenging problem of multi-target domain adaptation, we propose a new approach that we call the curriculum graph co-teaching. And uh, uh, this um, approach is based on three key ideas the, that uh, will allow us to alleviate multiple domain shift all at the same time. The first key idea is that we need a, a powerful and robust feature space for all the data in all the domains. And for that, we propose to aggregate features to graph convolutional neural networks. We also, um, since we have a lot of target data and this target data don't have uh, uh, labels, we, can, we need to resort on pseudo labels. But as you know, pseudo labels are very noisy. So we also devise a co-teaching scheme that allows us to derive robust and accurate pseudo labels. Finally, when you have a multiple uh, target domain, it is uh, a good idea to perform a smooth adaptation over the domains and maybe consider the easier domain first and the most difficult domain later. For this, we introduce the idea of curriculum learning. So these are the three key ideas of our approach, but let's have a look at the technical details. So the first of our uh, uh, contribution is to integrate a GCN inside the deep architecture. 
so the GCN create a, a graph between all the samples in the mini batch and aggregate uh, features from similar samples for all the domains. Similar samples mean samples that have the same labels. That means that for the source, you can use the label, but for the target, you need to resort on pseudo labels. For this reason, we need reliable pseudo labels. How do we get reliable pseudo labels? We get reliable pseudo label by integrating co teaching. In particular, for the unlabeled target samples, we design a deep architecture that has a shared feature structure, but then two heads. We have a double head, a dual head classifier. So the first head is a regular MLP classifier, the second head is a GCN classifier. And then we have uh, pseudo labels uh, uh, from the multi layer perceptron that are used to supervise uh, the GCN head. And the reverse, we have uh, uh, pseudo labels from the GCN classifiers that are used uh, for uh, uh, supervising the MLP head. So the idea of co teaching is not new, but the application of co teaching for domain adaptation uh, and uh, in the case where one of the head is the GCN is totally new. The last uh, of our contribution is the domain curriculum learning. As I said before, it makes sense to have a smooth adaptation process where we first consider the easier domain, and then we learn a feature space, and then we consider the second easier domain. We uh, repeat the, the procedure and integrate progressively all the target domains uh, according to their difficulty. The way we measure the difficulty is based on entropy and will be discussed shortly. Let me give you an overview, a uh, more detailed overview of our architecture. So uh, we have uh, uh, source and target data. The source data are annotated, the target data from multiple domain don't have annotation, and then we have a common feature structure. Then uh, the network uh, integrates uh, an MLP classifier trained with cross entropy on label and pseudo label at is, as it is common in domain adaptation. And also we integrate uh, a gradient rehearsal layer and the domain discriminator following the Sidan approach that is also common in domain adaptation. Our main contribution is this one. So we integrate a second head that is a GCN classifier, as I told you before. The GCN classifier is made of an edge network and a node classifier. The edge network uh, basically computes an affinity matrix that uh, indicates the pairwise similarities among samples in the mini patch, while the node classifier is used uh, actually for classification. Then uh, we have uh, a co teaching uh, uh, scheme, uh, the same co teaching scheme that I told you before, and in particular uh, the pseudo label for. Uh, the ML, from the MLP classifier are used for uh, better supervising the, the learning of the edge network. And uh, uh, similarly, the uh, pseudo labels derived from the GCN classifier are used uh, for uh, supervising the MLP head. Uh, in this case, the curriculum means that the training uh, proceeds at episodes. So uh, uh, we have a K um uh, episode uh, and then we retrain the multi-layer perceptron head with the supervision of the GCN. The last uh, contribution is the integration of domain curriculum learning into our framework. So again, uh, uh, we have a source uh, domain, data from the target domain, and what, then what we do? Then we choose the easiest target domain, and to do that, we compute uh, the average entropy of the pseudo labels and uh, associated to this target domain and we take the target uh, domain with the lowest entropy as the simplest domain and then we apply our framework we compute the pseudo label and then we integrate now the labeled target into the source domain and we get the pseudo source domain and then the, we choose uh, sorry then uh, we choose uh, the next, uh, ah, now <laughs> the next target domain here, uh, and uh, we integrate into the training and we repeat. So let me finish this and then clear. Okay, so once we have created uh, our uh, 
pseudo source domain, we will integrate the second easiest target domain and we repeat the procedure creating a new pseudo source domain and so on until all the target domain are integrated. Again, the criterion is the lowest entropy for all the samples in the, that target domain. Let me conclude with some quantitative results. So we first conduct an, an ablation study to um, understand the, the impact of all the technical components of our approach. In particular, in the table, baseline refer to our method with the multi-layer perceptron head and the gradient rehearsal and domain discriminators. Then, uh, if you examine the um, performance here and here, uh, you will see the impact of the domain curriculum learning that will uh, give us uh, uh, almost one point of average uh, accuracy improvement. This uh, experiment has been conducting on the Office Home dataset. Also, if you compare the, um, this number with this number, so the number that are associated to the red arrows, you see the great advantage brought by the GCN in order to perform a feature aggregation of samples of different domains. So this is really a huge boost. And then uh, here, if you compare these two numbers, you see, for instance, the impact of co-teaching that allows us to denoise the pseudo label and allows us to gain two points. In this slide, uh, we have examined uh, if the entropy is a good criterion for choosing the order of domain. It appears indeed that it's a good criteria. This is uh, our experiment conducted on two data sets, Office Home and Digis 5. If we pick uh, the order of the domain according to the entropy, we have the performance associated to the blue bar. While uh, if we choose, for instance, the reverse order, we have uh, a drop in performance. We also conducted uh, similar experiments with uh, random uh, order of domain. Finally, some comparison with state-of-the-art approach. Our method is the state-of-the-art for uh, multi-target domain adaptation. These are very recent te uh, technique uh, applied to the same problem. Interestingly, our approach is also competitive uh, when you apply this to the single target domain case. These are results on the large uh, domain net data set. Uh, also here we uh, improve over the state of the art by more than five points. Before concluding, let me leave you with some take home messages. We have discovered that uh, GCN are a very powerful tool for uh, multi-target domain adaptation because they can really provide uh, robust features across uh, multiple different domains. We have also discovered this uh, with no much surprise that pseudo labels are very important, but you need good pseudo labels. So you need to have a very powerful technique to remove the noise in the pseudo labels. And we believe that co-teaching is indeed powerful enough. Finally, uh, uh, for multi-target domain adaptation, the order of adaptation matters and we exploit uh, domain curriculum learning as a technique that allows uh, to have uh, first adaptation on the easier domain and then adaptation on the harder one. Uh, we were the first indeed to apply curriculum learning to this idea of uh, multi-domain adaptation. Let me conclude uh, by thanking my collaborators. Uh, we have uh, the papers, the code uh, available uh, on this GitHub repository. Uh, I would like to thank all the collaborators and in particular Shubanka Roy and Evgeny Kirivishev who are the first author of this work. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, there is time for a quick question from the audience. There is any. Oh, I have a question, very simple yeah. question. Please. Uh, sure. Which is the role of the graph neural network um, in, in the sense of the topology of the network? Because you have to provide the topology, right, of the network, of the graph, sorry. The topology of the graph is uh, somehow... Like a star, kind of star, right? Yes, but it's somehow inferred from the similarity of the of the, the data in the, sim, the, the, the samples in the mini batch. Okay. This, this is, is where it... 
the, the contribution of the edge network that learned this affinity matrix. Oh, so it is learned. The topology is learned. It's yes. not manually. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So maybe another quick one. If there is, otherwise we can. Okay. So uh, thank you, Lisa, for the presentation. Let's uh, let's move to the next uh, uh, to the next presenter. Okay, can you hear me? It's me. Yep. Okay. So, uh, hi everybody. I am hi. Federico Pernici. I'm going to talk from the University of Florence. I'm going to talk about cores which stands for Learning Comparable Representation via Stationarity. This is a joint work with uh, Niccolò Biondi, Matteo Bruni, and Alberto Del Bimbo from the University of Florence. So this slide gives a, a brief overview of the talk. I will introduce the, what are compatible features, and I will present uh, our basic building block called Reponets, which is basically the building block to achieve compatibility through stationarity, and we will see what a stationarity is. And then finally, I will provide the detail of course, the course method. So let's start with uh, internal feature representation. Uh, modern and AI systems perform recognition exploiting internal feature representations that are typically learned by deep convolutional neural networks models. The output of these models in response to an input image is commonly referred as feature vector. Uh, recognition, uh, visual search, retrieval, re-identification, face recognition is, um, is achieved by indexing a large corpus of images, which is called the gallery set, according to their feature vector. This is gallery set, this is the feature vector. Of course, the indexing uh, task is achieved by tra a training data set. Uh, feature representation is also important for two key elements of intelligence, which are open set, which is able to detect unseen instances, and open world. For example, open world is very simple once we have a gallery set and a good representation, because learning a, a new object is just a matter of dropping a new feature onto the gallery. So there's an however, uh, unfortunately, DCNNs, Deep Convolutional Neural Networks, when updated or upgraded with novel data set or with uh, novel, uh, novel information, must re-index images in the gallery set to generate the new feature. So when new novel data arrives, new training is performed and uh, the old features are not more valid, Therefore, <clears throat> we define an. I mean, oops, there's a a piece of uh, piece of slide is outside the, the video. It seems to be this part. Anyways, compatible representations avoid re-indexing the entire gallery set. And why this is important? Because typically, re-indexing the gallery set is is computationally expensive. Typical applications are face or person recognition, social networks, uh, and lifelong learning systems. Basically, uh, compatible features allow new and old features to be directly compared. If learning is performed through time, they can be used inter interchangeably. And uh, compatible features are also interesting because they are Privacy, privacy preserving because there is no more need to uh, store images, the original images, and uh, and they are memory efficient because you know uh, images are much more bigger than their corresponding uh, features. Features is also a compact representation, not only semantic. So uh, why learning compatibility is is hard. Uh, because updating a DCNN model with novel data change the subspace basis vector. We, are, uh, we know that the, the learning representation is repeatable, but the internal representation changes every time. 
So compatibility is not free. It's not that. It's not for. It's not given for free. Uh, here on the right, this is a very favorable condition of learning. We have, uh, let's say, a very simple data set. This is a toy problem, basically. We have uh, MNIST data set with five classes learned on the on this part of the of the figure. And uh, on the right, we we learn a new class into the model by incremental fine tuning. So basically, this is a very very simple incremental learning condition. And even if this is is is, uh, is simple in terms of compatibility compatibility because you know the the the, the second the, the second uh, the learning step starts from the previous. So the orange, the blue, the red, and the the green clusters are more or less in the same place. The the addition of the the, the brown one uh, requires the other to make room the, the new class. Therefore, that the angle between the feature space the feature class is changing. And typically, if the if the angle is changing, since typically uh, retrieval uh, systems are based on cosine distance, the feature change. So uh, the the semantic change the the, the metric which is typically used to, 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 to retrieve the object is, is changing. So we are interested in learning compatible representation via stationarity. Basically, we want that uh, in, a, in incremental steps, the, the feature geometry does not change too much. And uh, this uh, will be achieved with uh, a system we have developed we, we, that we consider a basic building block to achieve compatibility. Which is called regular polytope networks, and uh, uh, basically there's a chain of, impl of implication. Fixed classifiers implies stationarity of feature, and feature stationarity implies feature compatibility. So, recently it has uh, been shown that uh, fixed and learned classifiers achieve the same classification accuracy. And specific, specifically, uh, stationarity also holds when new classes are added to the model. This is uh, an instance of class incremental learning. And uh, the simple rationale on why fixed classifiers imply stationarity is that a neural network typically uh, learn both representation and classification together, jointly. Uh, the classifier outputs in the last layer the probability of each class, and in which the log it, the, the, the term z, is computed by an inner product between the feature emitted by the last convolutional layers and by the prototypes of the classifier. Prototypes are typically columns. And this is very well known, can be, it is known that can be expressed by the product of the length of the two vectors. And by the, the the angle subtended by the two directions. Therefore, learning is uh, <coughs> achieved by uh, simultaneous alignment of the direction of the feature and of the prototypes. Therefore, if fix we fix the WI, the prototypes of the classifier, fix means that uh, such parameters are not undergoing learning anymore. So there is no gradient, no computational graph. The only feature, only the feature direction align toward the prototypes and not the opposite. What remains is how to set the values of WI, of the prototypes, the classifier prototypes. Oh, basically, we follow the linear classifier ideal behavior. That is, maximize the available space and maximize the separation between classes. This, <coughs> in turn, uh, translate into set the WI into the regular vertices polytope. What this means. In 2D, a regular polytope is an n-sided polygon. So if we look at this picture, this is the, a learned classifier. This is a fixed classifier in which the prototypes of the classifier are set to a, uh, an n-sided polygon. Oh, I forgot to mention, even also for the previous toy problem, that this is not, this is not a Disney 
uh, projection. These are the real feature in a 2D plane, in the 2D plane, since we, we basically set the, 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 the neural network to, to, to output two dimensional feature. And we can see here the evolution of the means of the class feature. I mean, this is not that the mean is the angle mean of the class feature and their respective prototype. If we look, for example, here, we see that uh, the prototypes and the feature cannot be aligned generally. While in the, in the case of the fixed classifier, the uh, features are stationary and more or less moves uh, uh, along the, the prototype. This provides the, the stationarity that we need to enforce compatibility. These are the two examples zoomed in. So what happens in high dimensional spaces? Uh, basically, regu regular polytopes are the generalization of regular polygons and regular polyhedra, which are also known as platonic solids. In uh, two dimension, there are infinite, an infinite number of polygons. In three dimension, there are five platonic solids. Four dimension, there are six. And in any dimension greater than five or equal to five, there are only three three regular polytopes. And they are called D simplex, D cube, and D orthoplex. And they have more or less this, 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 this appearance. So basically uh, what we do in order to implement uh, uh, regular, po uh, regular polytope classifier, uh, given the number of classes, K, we have to, uh, compute the dimension and set the final classifier to that dimension. And of course, uh, prototypes are set to the vertices of the, of the regular polytopes. This is a quantitative evaluation on ImageNet, which shows that basically uh, a standard learnable classifier has a marginal value because we are getting more or less the same uh, classification accuracy across several architectures and several baselines. There are many, many details here in this, in this table. So let's focus on just this last one. We see that, uh, the, for example, the orthoplex achieved more or less the same <coughs> classification accuracy. Here, the D is that the dimension. We, we've learned both the learnable classifier, the learning classifier and the, ortho, the orthoplex classifier on the same dimensional space. This is the learned classifier as originally uh, designed in the efficient net paper, which, in which the dimension is 1000 and, and more. So if you look, the, the, the the accuracy, the performance are more or less the same. So, what this what, why this is important? Uh, this uh, it means that uh, in okay, there's a, a biological plausibility of this model in the human brain, uh, in the mouse brain at least, uh, which means that the stationary features has been reported in many studies of working memory. Working memory can be considered as a, as a gallery. So feature in memory of mouses are represented as, as a stationary feature. So here is the representation space, for example, of a dog and a cat as uh, reported on a, from the neuroscience community. And uh, representation is fixed, is stationary. Of course, th there is not only a fixed representation, there are also a stationary uh, dynamic representation. So in, in, the, uh, in the mouse brains, are, uh, 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 empirical evidence show that uh, both, the, both, uh, both uh, representation is, 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 is present. And here, there is a classification with a fixed, with fixed weight, which is a fixed classifier, in which 
the performers are more or less the same as the, the dynamic weights, which is uh, which, which are learned by the uh, brain activity. So uh, we built upon we use the Raponet approach to 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 learn compatible representation. And how it how do we do? So given an old model, we say phi old, train it on tau old, which is the data set. We want to learn uh, a new model, phi new, train it on t new. So we basically uh, adopt the regular polytope network with pre-allocated class. Pre-allocated means that uh, it uh, imposes a margin, a margin between the uh, the future, the future classes that we don't that will arrive. And the, the currently learner classes. This is important because this margin basically separates the feature of the current learned classes and the future classes, keeping both both the, the prototypes stationary. And uh, has no prior assumption about the semantic similarity of future classes can be made because you know. Uh, the topology of the regular po polytopes changes substantially uh, from the uh, learned classifier. So we use the disimplex classifier, in which any prototype is equidistant for all, from all of the other ones. And how to evaluate compatibility? Uh, we follow the recent paper of Shen et al, recently published at CDPR. They basically <clears throat> show how to evaluate a uh, uh, compatibility uh, representation. The updated model, phi new, uh, the, the, the query set, which is this Q, extracted from the uh, new model, phi, phi, is used to extract feature Q from the query set images. The old model, <coughs> phi old, is used to extract the feature D from the gallery set. And the empirical compatibility criterion is, is computed as, as follows. There is, there is a cross, I mean, before uh, we, we have to specify a metric related to the task to be evaluated. For example, we have chosen uh, verification. So these two terms basically states that uh, if I extract the feature from the query with the new learned model and test with the old one and, and perform queries on the uh, gallery represented with the old one, this must be as a per, uh, of better performance of the, <clears throat> of the old representation of the query with the old representation made into the gallery. Both terms can be, uh, rep can be uh, called cross-test and self-test. And so we, this is the, what is, is going on in this in this in, this, in the in the evaluation of this empirical compatibility criteria? So we generalize it for multiple steps, and we obtain the following uh, compatibility matrix. So basically, this is the self-test. This is the cross-test and the self-test on phi two. This is the same on phi three, phi four. Etc. So we obtain this matrix, and this matrix will provide uh, an overview of the compatibility uh, performance that we obtain. So we, in this, in this evaluation, we've chosen Cipher 10 for learning, and we test on Cipher, sorry, Cipher 100 for learning, and we evaluate it on Cipher 10. This because they are disjoint, typical recognition is performed with this joint training test in terms of classes, of course, not on instances. We perform 10 steps of learning incrementally. And the first training set is 20% of the data, which somewhat recalled a, a form of pre-training. The other 80% of data is divided in nine steps. And M is the verification matrix. So uh, oops, let me. Uh, for interruption. There was a zoom here. There is no more zoom. Sorry. Okay, zoom in. 
as it can be noticed, these are the, the current state of the art method called BCT, which is called backward compatible training. And every time the, the ACC, the uh, empirical compatibility criterion is not met, then there's a red square here. So at the first, a first glance provides that or all method, all method is much more compatible than the than BCT. Moreover, if you look at the uh, verification score, uh, our method is, uh, is, is best performing. And uh, if you look also at the color, the blue color indicates that the improvement. Here we have light blue and here the dark blue. OK, this is the, the detail. Ooh, these are the qualitative results. So we go back on, on the same problem of before. So the toy problem in 2D with MNIST. This is the incremental fine tuning. We have uh, incremental fine tuning does not achieve any stationarity. The angle between class features change every time. If you look at the red classes, for example, it's continuously changing. Here, the blue, the, the gray, square and the green square indicates the new class that enters. This is the BCT. Some feature classes achieve stationarity, some other not. Also, it's always the, the, the red features classes is indicated. And this is our, our method. If you look all the, all the, yeah, here. Every time a new class enters, for example, here the, gr the gray, here the green, but all the previous feature classes are, are stationary. Here is the same red classes uh, highlighted. OK, so in conclusion, stationarity implies compatibility. Stationary representation is biologically plausible, and the promoted method improves the current state of the art. And uh, this is a way, we, we propose a way of performing sequential feature learning with memory banks. And the uh, future work promises, it, is, uh, promises potential for learning both the feature and the memory without considering the joint learning. Because uh, memory networks typically don't perform joint learning of representation and uh, memory. So this is a way trying to improve this learning paradigm. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Federico. And uh, we are a little bit late with schedule, Sorry. so I uh, we need to proceed with next. Yeah, uh, of course, no problem. Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Three minutes. Uh, so the next uh, um, the next speaker is uh, Alexei Ozerov. He will talk about flexible resource adaptable deep models in the interface. Inference, sorry. sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> do you see my presentation? Uh, yes. Yeah. He, 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 hello, everyone. Uh, so, I'm Alexey Ozerov from Interdigital. And uh, today I will speak to you about flexible resource adaptable deep models at the inference. So this work was done by many uh, colleagues uh, from, from my lab. Uh, here are the names and pictures. And uh, so, uh, first of all, why do we need uh, flexible networks and actually what it is? Uh, so the deep models <clears throat> are increasingly run uh, closer to user devices. And uh, this is, uh, first of all, to improve latency of the processing and um, to reduce network congestion, to preserve the privacy, and also to make profit of all these AI chips that are available on these devices. Uh, however, edge computing and the shared hardware 
is difficult to, to make use of because of uh, the constraints such a, such a energy constraints, computational constraints, and memory. And also that those constraints uh, vary over time and over space. In other words, the processing resources may not be available everywhere and all the time. So the goal of flexible networks uh, consists in instantly uh, is to instantly provide the best possible performance under possibly variable constraints such as uh, limited processing power, limited energy consumption, uh, limited memory footprint, uh, or constraint processing latency that might be required for some applications. So in, in presentation, I will talk about two works, uh, one on uh, flexible recursive neural networks. Uh, this um, approach is called skip window and it was accepted to ICLR uh, conference and uh, it is actually presented uh, today at the conference. And another work uh, uh, is uh, we try to improve training of uh, some uh, flexible CNNs and uh, this work was submitted to the UCIPCO conference. Okay, I will start with the first one. Actually, I'm not, uh, I was not involved in this work, so I will try to present it uh, as best that I, as I can. Uh, yeah, so uh, let, let's consider that we have uh, an RNN here represented uh, above. Uh, and, uh, for example, targeting human activity recognition. So, as the input, we have some video of a human, and uh, every frame is first processed by a CNN to recognize the pose, and then uh, the RNN in behind uh, tries to uh, re recognize the activity. So, uh, well, Everything would be fine if we run it on, on some low power device, but uh, uh, it could be that uh, while running some another process started and we don't have uh, any more all the available resources. So if we have a regular none, we, we uh, have a problem because we just need to stop processing and we cannot uh, do anything more. So the idea of uh, flexible solution is that once the available resources has changed, here, for example, we can pass from configuration A to another configuration B that is uh, uh, requires less resources, uh, but also gives a less great result. And then once another process has stopped, we can go back to configuration A. Uh, so, okay. So the, in fact, uh, when this work was done, there was uh, uh, really no other RNN approaches that we can, can call flexible. Uh, there were several recent works addressing accuracy processing trade-off in uh, uh, CNNs by, for example, adding, removing the neurons, a sort of adaptive pruning uh, by changing quantization, uh, early exit networks, or by using multiple mechanisms. And in the world, world of uh, RNNs, uh, some work proposed uh, very uh, small architectures, but uh, those uh, are not flexible. And then other works, like for example, skip RNN, uh, do conditional exp uh, computation, so basically they uh, don't process all the entries. For example, if some entries are simple and uh, are not necessary, they can be discarded. But uh, this uh, approach is still not flexible because it doesn't allow trade-off between uh, uh, the precision and speed. Uh, Okay, so now about the proposed approaches that is called skip window. 
So on the top, uh, you may see a regular RNN that will process all inputs, for example, the input images in our case, X1, X2, X3, etc. And uh, so you have uh, some internal state of RNN S uh, that is running behind and uh, every time it is updated. So uh, the author so of this work has pro proposed to simply split uh, all the input entries into uh, the windows of the same length. And uh, within each window, they have proposed a mechanism that allows upfront to uh, decide which entry would be more important to process. So to give a sort of confidence score to all the entries without yet processing them. And uh, given this score, they can choose the key uh, most important inputs and uh, to process only them by skipping all the others. So this really accelerates because as you can see, uh, this RNN will not even need uh, to run uh, any CNNs behind uh, that process the images when these entries are skipped. So this uh, actually not processing CNNs uh, gives uh, the most improvement of the performance. So uh, changes this key value can uh, trade off between the uh, accuracy. And so the proposed approach uh, the, was evaluated on this um, uh, human activity recognition task. <clears throat> so you see, you can see the plot uh, accuracy versus uh, the number of processed input that is sort of related to the speed. And uh, the proposed approach is uh, represented uh, here by dots. And um, they try to, to, to uh, evaluate uh, different window sizes and different values of K. And they use, as you may see, the longer the window, <clears throat> more uh, dots you may ob obtain. So to have uh, more possibility of trade-off. Uh, and uh, what is very surprising to see is that this approach uh, uh, outperforms all the static baseline as well as skipper and then while those static baseline and the skipper and then are not flexible actually those curves are obtained by running uh, different models and also it outperforms some another flexible baseline proposed previously by the authors the red dots so okay uh, it was also shown that uh, these uh, configurations may be actually changed seamlessly online. So we don't need to fix one configuration, but if the uh, available resources has changed, uh, like I shown before, uh, the approach can uh, just uh, seamlessly change from configuration A to B and uh, to run in a new different regime. And also the approach was measured in terms of energy consumption on uh, two platforms, Jetson Nano and the Jetson TX2. And it was effectively shown that it allows to saving uh, the energy of the, on the device as it's shown, uh, it is shown on these plots. Uh, so, okay, now uh, about the second paper that is called um, in place knowledge distillation is teacher assistant for improved training of flexible deep neural networks. Um, so now it is about flexible CNNs. And by flexible CNNs, we understand uh, usually a set of CNNs trained from, for the same task that correspond to different complexity performance trade-offs. Uh, and at the same time, they strongly share the parameters. For example, we are sort of a nested structure as uh, represented here at the left. So we have uh, some uh, bigger uh, CNN and then other CNNs uh, included inside uh, in a nested way. And everything is trained jointly by sharing the parameters. And uh, at the test time, uh, we just uh, choose a suitable uh, CNN from the set of CNNs 
uh, according to the capacity of our device, <clears throat> and we run it uh, at the inference. Okay, so many recently proposed CNN frameworks are flexible. Uh, for example, early exit networks, uh, neural mixture models, uh, slimmable and universally slimmable networks, or once for all networks. And uh, also flexible CNNs may be helpful for efficient neural architecture search, as it was shown in a recent paper called B Big NAS. Uh, well, in this work, we are interested in uh, uh, improving flexible CNN training. Okay, so first a few words about a very well-known technique that is called knowledge distillation, uh, proposed uh, in uh, to 2015 by Hinton and colleagues. That is also very useful for model compression. <clears throat> so, uh, how, how it works, uh, so we, in knowledge distillation, we usually train a very big model from the data. And uh, then we take a sm uh, much smaller model and we train it by distilling the knowledge from the big model. And it, this was shown to work much better for this uh, small called student model than to train a student model directly <laughs> from the observations. It is really striking for me how uh, this process looks like we are learning in the real life, uh, because let's consider here, I found some funny pictures of uh, some uh, teacher, let's say, uh, some uh, senior scientist uh, and uh, some undergraduate student so both of these two persons, they have the same observation of the world. However, the much more experienced serial scientists can uh, do a very extraordinary uh, um, uh, findings, uh, explorations. Uh, and student at, at this stage is yet learning, so uh, he cannot yet uh, do uh, such uh, ex explorations because of lack of experience. But the student can listen to the uh, senior scientist or professor and uh, to learn from him and then repeat what uh, he told him. Uh, so, okay, so there was a, a knowledge distillation and then recently an extension was proposed that is called knowledge distillation with teacher assistant. Uh, so basically, if we draw the analogy again, with how we learn here, uh, well, let's say that we know very well if the university professor will start uh, to teach primary school children, that it, it could be kind of a disaster. Uh, but uh, we all know that the university professor can teach the school teachers, called well, teacher assistants in this case, and then the school teachers will uh, teach uh, the children and uh, this usually works well. So the teacher assistance is sort of comes here to bridge the gap uh, between uh, a very big teacher and very small student. Uh, okay, so knowledge distillation was also used to train flexible CNNs. And one technique is called in place knowledge distillation. So when we learn these uh, flexible models uh, jointly, actually, instead of learning all of them jointly from the data, only uh, the big model, blue one here, is learned from the data, but all other smaller models are distilled from the big model. And it is called in place because everything happens jointly by sharing all the parameters. Uh, and we tried to propose an extension of that uh, actually by introducing the concept of teacher assistant. So basically we just moved here one error. So the uh, green model uh, here is still uh, distilled from the biggest blue model, uh, 
uh, but the smallest purple model is now teached by a smaller uh, green model instead of the blue one. Uh, so we tried to explore this idea uh, and we, uh, so some results we evaluated. So here you can see uh, the plots of accuracy versus uh, basically a num number of early exits or network widths that correspond to the performance of the networks more or less. Uh, so we, we evaluated on the MSDN network which is an early exit network and the slimable mobile net v v1 on cfr 10 and cfr 100 well the improvement is not uh, always very big and uh, it improves on only in some cases but in other cases it works uh, almost as good as the state of the art so the uh, red curve is uh, more or less uh, is uh, outperforming or works similarly Okay, so in this presentation, we have presented two flexible deep model approaches. Uh, first one is skip window for flexible resource adaptable RNNs. And the uh, second one is in place knowledge distillation with teacher assistant for improved flexible CNNs training. And we are now working on flexible models that are distributable over several devices. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, if you have any question, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do we have any question from the audience? Okay. If not, maybe I can ask one. Um, I I. I wanted a little bit to understand what is the, the, your last uh, uh, your last thing you showed, right? So the the um, the teaching assistant, uh, uh, I think slide nineteen, yes. Uh, is this uh, mean that, uh, that we are sharing weights, right? If uh, yeah, yeah, the well, networks uh, are sharing. Actually, this network as they are sharing the weights, basically. Uh, you have uh, several instances, for example, uh, for mobile net, <clears throat> but at the end you have just one model. You, uh, the the um, how to say the advantage of this flexible approach is, is that that we don't need to have uh, several models. We they all share the same weight. So, but how do they they are connected if they are uh, of different dimensions? Uh, if I correctly. <clears throat> Okay, there are several approaches. One of one of uh, is, uh, for example, called uh, slimable networks. They just change the network widths, so this way they they become connected. They just it's sort of a structural pruning of all the neurons that are above some fixed widths. Okay, uh, but you have a more elaborate techniques. So you can also try to skip some uh, some layers and th this way you were you were also the depths of the network but they still uh, continue sharing the parameters okay uh, okay okay yeah thank you so with pruning you are uh, removing a lot of weights and you are saving a lot of uh, memory somehow for example yeah this is yeah yeah for it's one, one example yeah you can change also kernel size you, you the input uh, image resolution and these these things Okay, okay, thank you. I think if there is any other, if there isn't any other question, we can move to the next speaker. Thank you for the. Thank you. The starts to stop sharing. Uh, uh... Okay, so our next presenter is our uh, guest presentation. This is the, our first guest presentation is uh, uh, Xavier uh, Almeida um, Pineda from Iria, Grenoble. Um, the the title of the presentation is unsupervised uh, audiovisual fusion for upstream human behavior understanding hi Xavi. good morning everyone can you hear me yes wonderful so thanks uh to the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to this ai for media workshop i'm very happy to be uh 
to be here to explain uh, you a few things that we are doing on uh, at supervised audiovisual fusion. So my name is uh, very long, so you can just call me Xavi. And I am a researcher at Inria and at uh, Université Grenoble Alp. And today we will be uh, uh, discussing uh, this unsupervised visual fusion, fusion for what I called upstream human behavior understanding. And I will try to give a bit of context to explain what, what do I mean by that. Um, so when, when uh, most of the, the, the applications for which we are, uh, uh, the, the community is developing human behavior understanding is to then serve some kind of product or system or, or whatever entity that will be running it, let's say in the wild, right? So in, in the kind of scenarios that, that you can see here, halls of hospitals, uh, meetings, and these kind of scenarios in which it, there is no control or constraint on the, on the human, um, human, human interactions. So before we start wondering uh, how to do, um, let's say, um, what often is called downstream tasks, such as the speech recognition, emotion recognition, uh, interaction uh, understanding, these kind of things, we need to be sure that the, the most, uh, you know, the earlier tasks in the pipeline are robust enough so that then these other tasks that are um, more high level and that are more interesting can be achieved. So typically, if you don't have a very good uh, person tracking uh, uh, system, well, it's kind of useless that you try to uh, understand, uh, you know, F formations or, or groups of people that are discussing or who is interacting with whom. And the same happens for other things. If you don't have a speech enhancement, then uh, trying to uh, run a speech recognizer is probably useless because the speech signal is so corrupted that uh, ASR systems will not uh, necessarily work. So then another strategy could be, uh, okay, well then let me, let me be a bit brute force and take lots of data and then train my downstream systems with this data. And that it could be a strategy. I'm not a lot of in favor of that. First, because uh, it doesn't allow me to do research. <laughs> it doesn't go in my direction. But also because I think that uh, recording enough data, for instance, to train an automatic speech recognition system in the wild is really difficult. Annotating and, and sorry, collecting and annotating is very time consuming. So I prefer to have a different uh, line of investigation in which uh, we go one step at a time and we try to make these upstream tasks more robust so that then the, the downstream tasks can be done in, uh, in better conditions. So the motivation for the visual fusion is very simple. It's, it's twofold. First of all, um, we human beings communicate mostly through the uh, audiovisual, uh, auditory and visual channels. And as a natural consequence of that, uh, the sensors that we have, that, that are cameras and microphones, are really mature. So what we are going to discuss today is uh, two audiovisual tasks. First one is multi-speaker tracking, and second one is uh, speech enhancement. And we are going to be doing that with um, unsupervised probabilistic models with latent variables. So. Typically here we have some data uh, that we are going to note by X and these data are going to be uh, uh, some visual features and some audio features. And from this data, we want to both learn a probabilistic model and then infer the latent variables that can be, for instance, a latent speech signal. And this, so this will be Z or the positions of the people in the, in the image, right? So first we estimate the parameters and then we infer the, uh, the latent variables from the posterior probability given these parameters. So this is a standard practice. The problem is that apart from a few um, very simple models, uh, direct optimization of the load likelihood is not really uh, tractable computationally. So there are two paradigms to cope with that. Either the, uh, uh, and they are very famous, so this is, uh, I'm just describing this at a very high level, uh, either the expectation maximization or EM algorithm that has 
two steps. So the EM is iterating between two steps. So the first step computes the posterior probability over Z, and then this uh, auxiliary function capital Q. And then during the second step, we optimize Q with respect to the parameters, and then we go back to the first step. So this is an, a two-step iterative algorithm. And then there are variation of encoders, which are uh, optimizing uh, a combination of what we call a reconstruction loss and a regularization loss. But this is done at once. Of course, it's an iterative algorithm because it's a gradient descent, but it has only one iteration, one kind of iteration at a time. So let us go to the first um, uh, task, which is the visual speaker tracking. Uh, this is a collaboration with uh, Yutong, which is uh, an ex PhD student. Uh, Laurent and Radu, that are colleagues here in Grenoble, and that appeared or was accepted at, uh, at TIPAMI uh, a couple of years ago. And the uh, aim here, of course, is to track using audiovisual data. And we will assume that we have, for instance, uh, a phase detector or a person detector that is producing bounding boxes that you can see in the image in blue. And also uh, an uh, uh, audio detector that is extracting auditory features that will be here seen in green. All right. And then our aim here is that is to have a method that does not require a continuous flow of audiovisual, auditory, and visual data, but that can cope with data that is uh, present in an intermittent manner. So sometimes I have only audio, sometimes only video, and sometimes I have both for a given source, of course. So, and and this is a, this was very interesting a couple of years ago because. Most of the methods in the literature that were based on uh, particle filters or, or probability hypothesis density, um, they were requiring an uh, almost continuous flow of flow of the visual observation. So you, so in in the vision, I think this doesn't seem too bad because of course when you see a person, when the person is in the image right now, the detectors basically they rarely miss a person. Uh, but on the audio side, this is very strange because it means that we would need to be speaking all the time. And this is very, I mean, this is very unnatural. For the vision side, of course, the problem is that if you have a, a, a fisheye or a 360 camera, then you see the person all the time. But if you have a narrow camera, which actually happens for many, many devices, you see the person as long as it is in the field of view, but when the person gets out of the field of view, but then in this sense, you have zero visual information, okay? So requiring a continuous flow of audiovisual information, I think that for realistic environments is uh, quite a strong constraint. So in the proposed model, just a couple of notations so that we are able to interpret a little bit the two or three formulas that will, uh, uh, sorry, that will appear uh, ahead. We will be, uh, tracking n people, n is just a maximum number of persons. <clears throat> uh, at every time step, uh, we will have uh, k observations. Of course, this number can be different for uh, visual observations and for audio observations. And then what it is very important here, which is one of the difficulties, is that we need to assign each of these observations can be a bounding box or one of these audio observations that I told you before. We need to assign each of these observations to uh, each of the persons that are being tracked. So for this, we have this assignment variable that, of course, is latent. Uh, and this is a bit like the assignment variable of a GMM, <clears throat> of a Gaussian mixture model, for those who know that. So it basically uh, assumes that each observation can be associated to only one person. And of course, the other latent variable is uh, the position of the person in the image, which is going to be this y t n for time t and source n. And then we assume something that is very uh, standard, which is that uh, to, to make it very easy, all the dependencies are uh, Gaussian. So, so this is basically to replicate uh, the model of the Kalman filter, but for each source, right? And then, uh, of course, the, the aim here is to infer the position of the source, which is this YTN, given all the observation, right? Which is this X and then from 1 to T and 1 to K. So 
Uh, this is quite all right in the sense that we can write this, uh, uh, this distribution. It's actually a Gaussian mixture model. The problem is that the number of components of the Gaussian mixture model increases exponentially over time. Uh, this, you can imagine what happens is that basically after 10 seconds, you may have uh, millions of components and this becomes computationally intractable. So how to address that? Uh, to do that, we, we, we have these two remarks. Now, if, if this is like, if we set ourselves in an academic uh, uh, setup, if we knew the positions, this YTN, then this observation to source assignment would be just the, the same problem as it, of a, that we have on a GMM in a Gaussian mixture model. So it would be a, a NEM algorithm, and this we know very well how to do. Now, if on the other side, we knew these assignments, so we knew which uh, observations were assigned to each source, then the tracking problem would be just a Kalman filter. So this is very easy to solve as well. So what we do is to impose that this posterior probability here is actually we impose that is separable into the, into the two kinds of latent variables. So we will impose that this is a product of two distributions, one for the positions of the speakers and a second distribution of the assignment variables. And the, the conclusion of that, I mean, the, the, the outcome of this uh, approximation is that we will be alternating between a GMM and a Kalman filter. So, I'm skipping some details here because uh, it's a bit tedious from a mathematical perspective, and I don't want you to—I don't want to bore you with this. But you, the, the take message here is: thanks to this variation approximation, we alternate between two steps that are computationally very efficient, and this is basically replacing this huge uh, GMM with uh, millions of components. All right. So this very simple approximation allows us to handle the computational adaptability. And what I would like to just uh, put a bit forward is that uh, when we compute the position of the source uh, at time t and for the source n, so this mtn is my estimate of the bounding box of the source, we can, the formula is actually very nice because we have three terms. The first term is the visual contribution, which is here in blue. The second term is an audio contribution, which is in green, and the third term in black is basically the past. Okay, so for those who know the Kalman filter, in the Kalman filter you have two terms, the past and then the observations. Now, because I have two kinds of observations, I have one term for each uh, modality. And what does this mean? Uh, if we make, we look closer a little bit, we have these alphas here, which are basically the estimate of the assignment variable. So if no visual, um, observations are assigned to one source, all this alpha will be zero. And therefore, I will be tracking only with the audio contribution. If on the other way around, all the green alphas are zero, I will be tracking only with the visual contribution. And if none of them are zero, I am tracking with both of them. So this allows me to do exactly what I wanted at the beginning, which is tracking either with one of the two modalities or with the two modalities. And therefore, I don't need any more this continuous flow of audio and visual observations over time. So in order to provide uh, some results, we use this um, uh, AVDR data set um, and we masked. So the, the zone, the, the, this area of the image that you see in blue is um, uh, an area for, from which we don't use visual observation. So basically we assume that the field of view of the camera is only this part of the middle, in the middle. And then we have all the observations projected into the uh, camera uh, field of view with a method that, I mean, st state of the art method at the time. Let's not discuss too much about that. But we basically able to project all audio information into the large uh, camera field of view but we will use visual information only in the center. So when we compared uh, to the state of the art, um, which are particle filters and PSG filters, uh, we are really uh, outperforming 
uh, th these methods for, for the simple reason that we do not require a continuous flow of, of audiovisual observations, and they do. So basically, when someone stops speaking or when someone gets out of the field of view, this, these methods completely lose track. Now, if we compare a little bit more in detail uh, to assess the advantage of uh, having this uh, audio uh, only, um, sorry, sorry, of um, incorporating the audio, we compared our method with a visual only method that is most, it's a, it's a previous work on, of us. Uh, and we can see that, uh, of course, on the, um, uh, on the if we compare uh, on the, this partial field of view, we can see that there is a bit of increase in performance. And uh, this is due to the parts of the tracks that are outside the field of view. It is not super strong because audio localization is much less precise than video localization. So even if we are able to provide an estimate, it's still a rough estimate. So the difference in performance is, is not super big. But still, we are able to track um, people outside the field of view uh, when they are speaking. So th this was uh, interesting. And I think I have a video here. Yes, that is basically showing the result on the top left. Uh, on the top right, it's showing the visual only localization. So this was the blue part in the equation that I showed before. On the bottom left is the audio only localization that is intermittent because it happens only when people speak. And then on the bottom right, it's let's say uh, the pass, which was the black term in the previous, uh, in the previous equation. So it basically uh, represents the history of the track. And this is why, uh, because these circles around each track represent the uncertainty. So this is why, uh, you know, visual uncertainty, you can see that it is roughly constant over time. The past, the uncertainty uh, that is associated to the past is the same, but it is smaller, right? Because the past carries the history. So it's much more certain about the position of the source. And then you can see that the audio uncertainty is quite big and it's really dependent on time. Because if I say just a word, it's very difficult to localize. But then when I say a whole sentence, I can have a bit more precision. You can also see that whenever two people speak at the same time, then it's a bit messy. Uh, this is because of the kind of uh, audio features that, that we used, uh, because we did not separate the sources at all. So this is still, uh, I mean, yet another problem. Um, the second contribution I wanted to discuss about is uh, audiovisual speech enhancement. And uh, uh, we are going to discuss uh, the results that we obtained uh, on two papers recently. Uh, one was published at uh, PSLP and uh, another on transaction and signal processing. The main actor in this is Mostafa, who is uh, now a researcher at INRIA in Nancy. And, but this is also joint work with uh, colleagues uh, uh, Simon, uh, Laurent, and Rod. So, audiovisual uh, speech enhancement uh, attempts to extract clean speech from a noisy. Uh, speech signal using both uh, this noisy speech signal and the associated uh, visual signal of the speaker. So in practice, we are going to be using this uh, lip region, okay, an image around the lips to uh, remove the, um, the noise in the speech signal. Um, there are uh, many uh, words in, um, in uh, the literature that do that in a supervised manner. So basically they are trained to denoise. Um, the problem is that they are, they are often, uh, they, they, they have good performance for the kinds of noise that have been seen at training time. So we would like to take a different approach in which we use only clean speech at training and then at test time, when we see the noise, we try at the same time to train the noise model and to estimate the clean speech. Sorry, there is some problem with the slide here. Uh, yeah, sorry for that. Um, so this is what I was trying to explain in the previous um, uh, slide. Uh, we, in supervised uh, visual speech enhancement, we give the noisy speech and the video frame. So we basically try and are training the network to the noise. 
In our case, what we are going to do is uh, train with clean data and then estimate the noise and remove it at the same time at test time. So, of course, this uh, can be done, uh, doesn't have to be done necessarily with auditory and visual data. We can do it with audio on the data and we will be comparing to that. And we can also input visual data and try to reconstruct the speech. Okay, we can train variational autoencoders to do that. Uh, but we have also proposed to train an audiovisual variational autoencoder in which uh, visual features are extracted and then concatenated both in the encoder and in the decoder. So just a little technical detail here, which I think is interesting. If you train this uh, architecture directly in the standard way, the problem is that you are inputting audio and video and you try to reconstruct the audio signal. So if you train it uh, with standard methods, the VAE doesn't have to pay attention at all to video because all the information to reconstruct the audio is of course in the very same audio signal that you are giving in the input. So in order to overcome this issue, we basically forced with this extra term in the variation lower bound that is in orange. So we forced the prior of the visual uh, features to have some reconstruction power. And in this way, the AVVAE was forced to exploit the visual signal. The problem of this audiovisual VAE is that it systematically concatenates audio and video. So it's a little bit the problem of what previous, previous tracking methods in the previous application were having, were having, right? So I am requiring that the audio and video are present and use, useful all the time, which is not going to be a real case in the wild because sometimes there is a lot of audio noise and then I don't want to use audio. And sometimes I may have a microphone in front of my uh, mouth, for instance, and then I don't want to use video because it's useless. So what we, we, we switch into this um, unsupervised uh, mixture of variational autoencoders. So I assume that there is this latent variable alpha that is choosing between using the audio or using the video. So it's choosing this in the generative model in the prior with two different priors, one for the video and one for the audio. And then as, uh, sorry, as a consequence, yes, that's a, the slide that I wanted to show, um, the encoder can also have this, uh, this tractor. So basically I have two encoders. I have a mixture um, variable that is going to select if I'm using audio only or visual only or half half. And then this is going to be given to the decoder to reconstruct the speed signal. And the, the most important thing here is that this uh, mixing is unsupervised. So this alpha n will need to be estimated at test time. So this requires a very, um, I mean, a lot of math that once again, I'm trying to synthesize as much as possible. And we are having a mixture between the EM formalism and the VAE formalism. So we will try, we will be optimizing a variational lower bound and at the same time running an EM algorithm, all right? Uh, so this is why you have this E alpha, E M alpha stats, and at the same time you have a reconstruction and a regularization loss for the variational autoencoder. So the nice part of this is that uh, the posterior distribution of the assignment variable of this alpha N depends actually on how well or, or how uh, bad uh, each of the encoders, each of the uh, audio and visual encoders is re uh, representing the latent, uh, the latent um, code Z, all right? So this is a bit abstract, but um, in a sense, what I'm trying to say here is that depending on the reconstruction capacity of each of the encoders, I will be, not I, I mean, the method will be looking more to reconstruct from audio or from video or from a mixture of the two, and it's doing that in an unsupervised way. So when we compared with uh, other fusion strategies and as well as uh, 
the audio only and visual only, and to the supervised methods, I'm not showing this here because there are, there are already many curves, um, we can see that this mixing has, um, has certain advantages uh, and often is able to uh, produce better results than audio only or the systematic fusion of audiovisual data. You can you can go to the uh, to, to our team's uh, web page and you will there be able to see a bit more uh, detailed explanations as well as here to some samples, which is uh, always interesting. So, uh, just to conclude, I think it's time anyway. Um, we uh, we have presented two two unsupervised probabilistic models that allow to do uh, audiovisual fusion for two upstream upstream tasks. So one was uh, audiovisual speaker tracking, and the second one was audiovisual speech enhancement. Because the these uh, posterior distributions that we need for uh, for unsupervised probabilistic models with latent variables were intractable in both cases, we had to resort to some uh, variational approximations, and these led to uh, a variational EM algorithm combined with this VAE training for the second task. And then looking to the future, so there are many things uh, to do. I'll, I'll not, I'll, I will not be jobless uh, in the next week, I think. So of course, there is this question that I mentioned how to separate at the same time that we are tracking. And this would actually uh, be very useful to better uh, localize uh, with the uh, audio information. Um, both the, the, the tracking and the dynamics of the conversation are, of course, very linked to the group. Uh, we have seen this on the video. There were two people speaking and then, then two people joined. And of course, this changes the dynamics of the conversation. It would be also very interesting to see to, uh, how to adapt to unheard environments. So right now, um, I'm now referring to the tracking part we are learning how to localize in a specific environment. And basically we are exploiting the reverberation patterns of that room in that position. And uh, this is a bit limiting. It would be nice to see how can we adapt to unheard envi environments. And of course, all these uh, would ideally should be done with very, very few uh, adaptation uh, data or at least very few data that requires to uh, record, you know, bunch of people that are, interaction, that are interacting in the wild for the reason that I explained at the beginning of the, uh, of the presentation. So I would like to thank you all for your attention and of course to uh, my collaborators with whom I, we keep trying to do uh, interesting things and I'll be happy to take, uh, to take uh, your questions if there are any. Thank you, Xavi. Uh, okay, if there is any question from the audience. Uh, I have a question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more regarding the scenarios for the visual uh, or the visual tracker part. Which kind of scenarios have you been used to test your methods? Mm -hmm. And especially, uh, what kind of you know adjustments should be done in order to deploy it in the wide scenarios like freestanding conversations, meeting scenarios? Right. Uh, so the kind of scenarios in which for which we developed this is um, it's the one that you can see here on the slide. Uh, the the scope of the team is on um, social human robot interaction. So basically, we want to ultimately to contribute to develop the robot that is able to discuss with, uh, you know, go and uh, approach people and then go to the next room and find a person and this kind of stuff. So this is why we're interested in these uh, scenarios. Uh, so now the challenges here, I think there are uh, uh, many. So on, on the visual side, I think as long as you see the person, there is not much to do because in this kind of scenarios that are not, I mean, that are not uh, 100 people, right? So the problem here is not that you will have uh, a very small person in the background that you cannot detect. So I think that on the detection side, it's, it's not too difficult. What is a bit more difficult is uh, what happens uh, when people arrive and go 
and and how this uh, impacts the dynamics of the of the group. And then also on the audio side, because as I said, we are exploiting these reverberation patterns, and they depend on the position of the sources within, inside mm -hmm. the room, the, the acoustics of the room, of course, but also on the position of the of the sensor. So in our case, because we are thinking about the robot, if the robot moves mm -hmm. every time it moves, the reverberation pattern changes a little bit, and this is a bit annoying. <laughs> and we are trying to investigate how to. Uh, how to cope with that and how to exploit that actually. Uh, so I would say these are the two um, the two main points. Uh, I don't know if this answers the question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we are a little late, but I have a very quick one, uh, a very quick questions, and it's about the the, the second work that you showed. And it's um, uh, and I wanted to understand a little bit about the the, the how to re how you reconstruct the the visual part. I mean, uh, while sharing the the latent representation, or uh, you said you 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 force the network to learn also the the visual. Ah, uh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, this is uh, here. So, yeah. so, so we don't reconstruct the visual part. What we are forcing the network, we are forcing the network to exploit the visual part to reconstruct the audio part. So be because the input audio and the output audio is the same, if I do nothing, even if I concatenate the video, mm -hmm. uh, the input has all the information to reconstruct the output. This S and at input, has all the information to reconstruct the output. So if I don't do anything, basically the network learns to ignore the video. So this is why we are having this extra term and we are forcing the decoder to give some reconstruction power from the, the visual prior. And then of course, because the visual prior has some reconstruction power, then the posterior distribution is, is implicitly also exploiting the, the visual information. So this is why we have this term here in which we are, it is a reconstruction term, and then the log likelihood is on the audio side, but then we are sampling from the visual prior. Okay. Okay, good. So thank you, Chavi, for the presentation. Uh, we need to switch to the last uh, uh, speaker before the break. For Most the welcome. Break. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. So, uh, as I said, last speaker is uh, uh, Dario Garcia Gazula from Barcelona. And uh, he will talk about, uh, he has a, um, the title is um, The Transfer Learning Trade Off uh, Fine Tuning or uh, Feature Extraction. Is the speaker available? Uh, I think he cannot hear you. The speaker is here, but we cannot hear him. Let me see. Okay. Maybe maybe we can uh, maybe we can have a, a break now and then we can start again with uh, uh, Dario after uh, after the break so we can save a little bit in the meantime maybe we can try to reconnect or hi and try to reconnect. okay my computer so... just crashed when trying to share the screen all okay. right all right good let's try again hopefully this time it will work uh... good there we go. Yeah, perfect. Great. Um, okay, so my talk will be uh, quite more practical and empirical 
um, uh, we we are investigating in the in the transfer learning trade-off, uh, which uh, we interpreted as as uh, the the comparison between fine tuning strategies and feature extraction strategies. Uh, so essentially, deep learning is a representation learning. Uh, uh, set of methods uh, where the goal is to transform the data into a different representation of the same data so that uh, tasks can be properly tackled. Um, and the power and, and most uh, relevant feature of deep learning, at least in my opinion, is, is, the, is this representation, the richness of these representations that are being built and that can be reused for many other purposes because of the, of the richness that they include considering all the data that is being used uh, to generate them. So when you when you do transfer learning, um, it's essentially starting. Uh, the idea is to reuse this representation. So you start learning from a place which is already uh, coherent. Um, so this usually yields uh, faster convergence. Uh, so the network learns faster. Uh, also better generalization uh, and uh, less computational cost because uh, well faster convergence uh, yields less computational cost and also less human effort uh, dedicated to to training uh, neural networks, which is uh, quite of uh, quite a lot of of, of work. Uh, so, in my experience, transfer learning that is uh, reusing a ne uh, neural network that was previously trained for a task is, is a good idea in the majority of the scenarios, uh, to 90%, with a few exceptions on those domains that are very different uh, from anything else, and in which it's very hard to find something that is useful in a pre-trained model. Uh, so, when we are transferring uh, knowledge, uh, we can, um, and this is uh, the difference we made between fine tuning and feature extraction. You can either use the pre-trained model as a starting point for uh, solving a different task and keep training the uh, the neural network. Uh, so this is what we call fine tuning. Uh, we have the neural network, and we uh, instead of randomly initializing it, we start with, uh, from this uh, pre-trained status, and then from there we 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 keep training uh, to to attach to. To adapt it to the to the new problem, or we can use uh, the 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 learn representations as they are without modifying them further. Uh, in this case, we're calling this a feature extraction scenario, in which we use the pre-trained model as a as a set of features that describe the data, and with that we do something else. Uh, but the features remain the same, and they are not modified. So usually, for example, you use a different classifier method, or you can use a, clus a clustering algorithm, or I mean, uh, you know, uh, many different things can be done with these representations. Uh, but of course, it's uh, it might be suboptimal because the representations that are being used in this second uh, in this second problem are not specifically designed for this task. So you're uh, you're sure that it's not a, an optimal representation. Uh, so the idea is when we have to choose when when can we choose between one or the other method. Uh, this is the idea of our of our research line, figuring out uh, which is the trade off between between one or the other and when one is recommended over the other. So the idea is how much data a bit is needed uh, to improve the representations, um, and when is uh, enough data to to consider that fine tuning is a feasible approach. So we to explore that we we consider a, a, a probably the most the most uh, stable case. Uh, so CNNs, which are, are very clearly uh, the most uh, reliable method in deep learning, um, the most tested one. Uh, so in, in and we use the most simple of tasks, which is just image classification, in which we have a pre-trained model uh, uh, for a source task and then a target task, and then we want to explore increasing the amount of of uh, training samples per class. Uh, we want to see at which point does uh, fine tuning outperform feature extraction. Uh, at not only at what point does it outperform, but uh, with what margin it outperforms it. Because if uh, if we are doing fine tuning, it requires uh, two weeks of uh, GPUs and, and a month of an engineer's work, uh, only to for gaining two percent of of, of uh, performance. It it might not be uh, worth it, depending on the application, of course. So this is a bit the, the scope of our of our approach. Uh, so we explore a, a set of pre-trained uh, CNNs, pre-trained on ImageNet, on places, also different architectures, BGGs, ResNets, Inception, Exception, Efficient Nets. I mean, there's a wide variety of models out there. Uh, we have a, a set of, of target tasks, uh, which ideally are not that large, because ideally you have to uh, you have a limited amount of samples to train for this. Uh, so this is just some of the ones we use. And then uh, for different uh, training setups, uh, we define how many samples per class we have available for training. So we start with one sample per class, two, three, five, and so on. And we keep increasing uh, to see how the performance this should be. We should see a curve that is increasing performance as, as more samples are available. 
Uh, then we have the different uh, training policies. We have uh, fine tuning. Uh, it's it's complicated because fine tuning you can uh, you can obtain better results the more time you dedicate to it. Uh, so uh, with limited hyperparameter exploration, uh, that is uh, uh, how many layers you freeze, how many layers you retrain, how many layers you randomize, uh, how, which optimizer you test, which learning rates, uh, and so on. So this, uh, we define a limited set of hyperparameters we explore, and then we will also want to test a thorough, uh, a thorough fine tuning effort in which we show the difference between doing a limited hyperparameter exploration or a, a very thorough analysis, which uh, will only be done in a very few cases because of the of the huge amount of uh, human and computational cost that it entails. Also, the external data is uh, also frequently used in fine tuning policies. Uh, but uh, we will not. We will try to stay away from that because uh, we already have state-of-the-art results for that. So most state-of-the-art results for most image classification problems are fine-tuning solutions with external data, and uh, this is very hard to replicate because it uh, usually uh, entails months of, of work. Um, and finally, we'll use the, the feature extraction approach, which uh, essentially we will test a, a couple of uh, post-processing methods. Uh, when you extract this activation from the neural network, uh, you can do several things to this representation to make it more uh, appropriate for the uh, post-processing uh, uh, classifier. In this case, we're using a linear super vector machine, and we have a couple of, of uh, methodologies in which you can uh, pre-process these representations before feeding it to the SVM uh, to see how it performs. So this is just a, a spoiler of how it uh, how our analysis looks. Uh, so we have this uh, in the x-axis. We have the number of samples per class. So this is one training sample per class to twenty or beyond. Uh, this for this in this case we only have twenty. But the idea is to go uh, well well above. And then we have the accuracy that we obtain. And then we have the the three policies. Uh, so uh, no, in this case we have this is only the um, uh, the. Uh, the limited uh, fine-tuning effort. So uh, we just explored a few hyperparameters. I think we tested uh, around 15 network configurations for, for uh, fine-tuning. And we can see already that uh, on some cases, so, uh, the comparable are the blue and the red, because the green is a different architecture, is the ResNet. And we haven't uh, performed yet the, the feature extraction um, part on this but if we look at the at the bgg results which the red is the fine tuning and the blue is the feature extraction we can see that the fine tuning starts lower because it, it it's harder to train from there but the gap is reduced as it goes further and eventually this line will cross with uh, with this one and fine tuning will become better than feature extraction at some point in in a certain amount of, of samples so the idea is to find where are the thresholds uh, where do they depend on uh, if they depend um, how do they depend on the similarity between tasks? How do they depend on the architecture? Because we can see here, uh, which is quite remarkable, that uh, ResNet with only one sample per class already achieves um, over 50% accuracy, uh, which is uh, something for Flowers 102. So it's a lot of, uh, of target classes. Um, so yeah, this is the analysis we're doing. We, we are scaling this up uh, in a lot of sources, targets, and architectures. And, uh, and the idea is to produce a set of, of guidelines and, and, and recommendations for for the practical use of these uh, two methodologies, uh, which are very, very frequent uh, nowadays. And that's it. That was uh, fast. Thank you for the, for the presentation. Thank you. Do we have any other question? Any question, actually? Okay, so um, uh, I have a quick one. And uh, what uh, what about uh, a very big uh, data set? Do you have any 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 test on those? So I think the largest we are considering is Food One Hundred One, uh, which has probably I think between five thousand training samples. But if uh, the idea of this is to target uh, industrial domains essentially, because uh, for large data sets you can train from scratch even. I mean, uh, or and you don't have that problem. The, the problem is when you are trying to do something very specific that doesn't look at all like the ImageNet, because ImageNet is used as a source for everything. But uh, ImageNet is is uh, animals and, and things. 
and uh, you know uh, quality process in an industry is, can mm -hmm. rarely benefit from from ImageNet. Uh, and usually uh, industries have a problem with uh, labeling data with large amounts of data. So uh, this is uh, the, the target, uh, figuring out these data sets that have limited availability and, and uh, very different domain to the ones that are uh, tackled by the research community um, to provide uh, recommendations how to how to build their models. Okay, and and uh, have you tried also different uh, different tasks like segmentation? I mean, have you planning something like that? So that would be a good idea, but um, it, it's hard because you have to look at the state of the art on on, on fine tuning and architectures and data sets and models, and for every different task is is uh, I mean the the. It's like a whole new problem, essentially. Um, so we will focus first on image classification. We will see how far we get, and depending on our results, we'll try to expand it to different tasks. By the moment, we will we will just limit ourselves to classification. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If there is any other question, I don't know. There is still time a little bit. So, okay. Thank you for the presentation, Dario. And uh, thank you. We can have uh, uh, we can have a short break. Um, welcome back, everybody. So this is Chidan Bayan. I am from University of Trento, and the second part of this workshop I will be moderating. Um, our first speaker in the second part is Hannes Fossold. Uh, he already shared the screen. Thank you very much. And the, the title of the speak is the distributed training and frameworks. So, Hannes, the floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I will switch to full screen. Is it now full screen? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, welcome to my talk. Uh, I will give an um, uh, overview, a high level overview about the uh, state of the art in, in distributed training and the, the key um, yeah, characteristics, and also a bit about the um, open source frameworks for distributed training. Um, so, what what is the motivation there? Uh, yeah, there are a couple of as aspects. Uh, the first one is that state of the art models. Uh, for deep learning, they get bigger and bigger, um, and also the data sets on, on which they are trained. This is true um, both in the image domain and also in the uh, NLP, so in, in text processing, natural language processing. Um, in especially in the text in the NLP uh, world. Um, the models are really huge. So the um, recent uh, GPT-3 model by uh, OpenAI, you for sure have, have read about it. Uh, here, the, the size of the, the biggest variant of GPT-3 is about 175 billion parameters. So won't fit in any GPU. And it's trained on yeah, very large text corpus uh, with uh, which compre comprises about 500 billion tokens. So you can imagine that the training time goes goes up and up. Um, even although, of course, in every uh, GPU generation, the, the performance is uh, rising. Uh, the other thing is that usually the training is not a, a sort of a, a single step process. So data set, train, and you are done. Uh, but instead, you have usually to do some, some tuning of the important hyperparameters of the a process of the training process, which are things like, uh, yeah, which learning rate is optimal, um, the, 
and other and parameters of the learning algorithm of the training algorithm itself. So for you have this, for example, for, for momentum and ADAM uh, algorithm, you have this momentum term and those have their own set of, of hyperparameters. Uh, the other thing is you might want to experiment and tune the architecture itself and might want to to find the best one um, for your task. So uh, you could do some, some network architecture such uh, either automatically or uh, hand by or manually. So this all uh, you know, needs a huge amount of, of training resources. So um, what is distributed training? In distributed training, the um, helps with um, in in training a, a single model faster, and that's done by um, in a way where the the training of the model is split up. And um, yeah, the processing is um, yeah, divided among multiple processors, uh, among multiple, yeah, yeah, usually they are called workers or nodes. You can imagine these as um, separate PCs connected with uh, yeah, Ethernet or InfiniBand infin network. Um, these um, so-called clusters, uh, so one such a training cluster um, can have only a few nodes or it can be your know, several hundreds uh, if you have a, a large uh, scale uh, training cluster. Yeah, and usually each of these um, nodes or, or workers uh, is a, is a multi GPU machine. So you have uh, between two to eight GPUs uh, in it. Yeah, so um, for distributed training, of course, the optimal case is linear scaling. So that means um, the training time is inversal, inversely proportional, proportional uh, to the number of workers. So let's say if you have 10 times uh, the number of workers, then ideally the training time will, would be only uh, one tenth. Uh, usually that's uh, not the case, unfortunately, unfortunately due to effects um, like um, the serial parts in your uh, computation paths they, of course, cannot be um, split up and they get more and more prominent uh, yet the more uh, workers you have. The other adverse effect is the communication cost. So that's for things like model updates, I will explain later. And uh, these, um, so this communication between the workers, it, um, may arise also in a ratio which is not only proportionally but quadratically also. So um, the nice thing is distributed training allows training from scratch uh, on a really huge data set um, in a couple of minutes. So for example, uh, Currently, the the classical um, training of an image classification model on the ImageNet data set um, can be done in less than two minutes, uh, but you need uh, yeah, approximately 500 GPUs. Um, yeah, and ImageNet is quite large. It has uh, millions of, of trainings and trainings image. So, uh, regarding the um, um, distributed training, there's a, a, a rough distinction between data parallelism and mo model parallelism. 
in data parallelism, uh, the training data is split into chunks. So you can imagine in each iteration, a mini batch is split into chunks. Um, and um, each worker processes then a chunk and uh, communicates the model updates. So it updates the model and, and communicates that to, to all others. Um, the advantage here is, yeah, it's, it's model agnostic, so you can apply that to any model. Uh, on the other side, the disadvantage is that, uh, yeah, of, uh, in each worker must have a, enough GPU memory to, ho to hold the whole model. And um, the other thing is you have to uh, communicate the updated model yeah, in, in regular um, um, times to all other workers. So you can see the, the scheme graphically on the right side. Uh, the other way to do distributed training is via model parallelism. And this is uh, when you split up the model itself into several parts. Um, and yeah, each worker then processes its uh, part, its model part only for which it is uh, responsible. And of course you have also to this, this communication between the, the, the workers because of, you have to yeah, propagate the result uh, between the, the uh, workers. The advantage here, the big advantage is that you have uh, support for large mem models which do not fit into GPU memory. Uh, so you can do sort of yeah, uh, train sort of uh, out of memory uh, models. And uh, the disadvantage on the other side, the main one is that you have to find a, a good split of the model and that depends uh, both on the model structure and also on uh, how many uh, workers you actually employ. So it's not that flexible in, in a way. Um, okay, uh, another way to uh, distinct, uh, the, to divide uh, distributed training uh, methods is uh, via the system architecture. So, the system architecture describes how the, the model parameter updates uh, are performed. So the updates of the uh, individual workers. And here you have mainly two different ways. Uh, the first one is uh, you have a centralized system architecture. Uh, you can see that on the right on the figure. Here, the workers uh, periodically uh, report their model updates to so-called parameter servers. Uh, these parameter servers uh, hold the, are holding the, the current model. Um, yeah, and there can be one or more of these parameter servers. Uh, on the other side, uh, and the more popular uh, architecture actually is a decentralized system architecture. And here uh, the workers uh, are exchanging their uh, individual model updates uh, directly uh, via a so-called uh, all reduce operation. Um, yeah, you can see the exchange of the model updates here uh, on the right side in the figure. So it goes more or less, um, it's an all to, all to all communication. And here um, for good performance, the, the topology of the all reduced operation is critical. So uh, the, naive, the naive way is to do it in a, to connect each worker to each one. 
so you have a fully connected um, graph. And here the communication is uh, quadratically in the number of workers, which is bad, uh, especially if you have a, a large number of workers. So let's say hundreds. Um, but the good thing is uh, usually there are high performance topologies employed like a, a ring like um, a graph or a tree or a butterfly. Um, and uh, there are dedicated um, libraries for that, uh, which do these in a, in a highly performant way, like from NVIDIA, the NCCL library, uh, which provides simply these primitives and does all the, um, uh, the communication efficient uh, implementation of the ORI does, it, it does yeah, transparently for you in a, in a highly performant way. Uh, the other way you can um, divide the distributed training methods is via their, their synchronization strategy. Um, there are here also different strategies. Um, you can do it uh, fully synchronize. synchronize. Uh, so here the synchronization uh, is for um, with respect to the to the model updates, more or less. so the model parameter updates. Uh, you can do that in a fully synchronous way. So you are synchronizing the model parameters after each iteration. So after each mini batch, more or less. Um, this has a problem which is called the, the struggler problem. Uh, which means that uh, the slowest worker uh, determines the performance of the whole um, of the whole thing more or less. And if you have one slow worker component, it will hold up all the others. Um, then you have a, so, um, a strategy which is called bounded asynchronous. And here the workers may are allowed to train on model parameters which are slightly outdated. So that's called uh, stale uh, parameters. Uh, so they might be a few iterations old. Of course here, you, this gives you more throughput because you have more flexi flexibility in the communication, in the update um, uh, step. And then there's the fully asynchronous uh, strategy. Um, here, the, the Hogwild algorithm is well known. And here the workers are updating their model completely independently from the others, um, which is of course very good in terms of throughput because you can overlap um, computation and communication very, very well. Uh, on the other side, it's difficult because all these are operating independent, independently. Um, uh, that's the reason it's uh, difficult to, yeah, um, to reason about whether the model converged or, or not. And actually you have a lot of models, not only one. And the other thing is uh, you have the so-called lost update problem. As a, it means that uh, new parameters written by one worker could be overwritten by another one. All right, then very shortly to the distributed training frameworks. So the, the main deep learning frameworks, which are PyTorch, TensorFlow, and MXNet, uh, they have a sort of, um, yeah, a bit of a support for distributed training. Um, yeah, actually one shouldn't call it distributed training because they are supporting mainly a single node 
but uh, they are using their all resources of the node. So they uh, uh, can train um, and use multiple GPUs uh, on that node. So you can call it multi GPU training. Uh, and then there are more elaborate uh, frameworks uh, like Haravot uh, by Uber. Uh, it supports uh, all major frameworks and uh, has support for data parallelism and also a limited form of model parallelism. Then you have uh, Fairscale, Fairscale framework by Facebook, which is uh, newer. And it's uh, PyTorch only and provides also yeah, data and limited model parallelism. Um, and then there is uh, another nice framework, which is DeepSpeed by, by Microsoft. It's also PyTorch only. And here you have data parallelism and also more or less full model and pipeline parallelism. And uh, they have um, also some nice uh, strategies for um, minimizing the communication cost uh, or the communication load by a gradient compression. So, for example, uh, they have one bit uh, ADEM and, and LAM. So that's that's it from my side. So a short, yeah introduction to distributed training uh i don't know do you have do we have time for questions yeah maybe we can take one question if, if there is okay so we can continue with the next presentation okay thank you very much for your presentation and um, the next presenter is manias krasana akis from Center, Center for Research and Technology, HELAS, and he will be presenting decentralized classification at the edge. Hello, uh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, very well. Okay. Um, so I also hope you're seeing my screen. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, so, uh, excuse me. Not yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, I'm uh, Manus Krasnak from CERTH. Uh, uh, I'm presenting the decentralized classification that I just uh, said already. Uh, this is a uh, joint uh, work uh, basically between AI for Media and Helios because we are uh, uh, the same people uh, in both uh, uh, projects. Um, so, so uh, the, the most important uh, question to ask before uh, even delving into details is what is uh, classification at the edge? So the important part is uh, that um, edge computing, edge computing aims to move uh, data closer to and the processing closer to devices and away from uh, servers. So uh, if we consider uh, like the, the internet, uh, then there is the cloud, which are services, servers, and so on. There are the edge nodes, which are uh, basically routers, and um, edge devices, uh, which are mobile phones and uh, Arduinos and uh, so on. Uh, even individual computers can be considered uh, edge devices. So the concept is uh, to uh, learn at uh, the, of, of learning at the edge is to uh, basically learn at uh, devices. Uh, this is similar to uh, what uh, Hannes uh, displayed as uh, decentralized learning uh, conceptually. Uh, I mean, it's also decentralized learning, but uh, this time we are not. Uh, we don't get to decide how data should be distributed between those devices. Uh, the important part is that um, uh, of edge computing is that uh, okay, of course uh, we have the in increased privacy because data are uh, near devices, but also we have um, increased uh, processing power because basically uh, processing power scales linearly with uh, new data. Uh, if if we add another person, then that person processes their own data and so on. Uh, so in the, in this in our work, we try to uh, check uh, for centralized uh, how to perform decentralized classification at edge. Uh, uh, this uh, first, uh, we consider a peer-to-peer -peer organization of devices. So there's no, we, we don't consider, um, we don't consider central infrastructure like such as servers or uh, services like Facebook. Uh, the devices directly communicate with each other. 
uh, each device hosts its own data. For example, well, let's say they have Alice and Bob, each hosts their own data, each has their own prediction, uh, prediction model, and each prediction model um, tries to, let's say, for these two users, classify those users. Okay. And um, the important part is that uh, we also have ground truth labels available only for some users. Um, for example, let's say that, that we had uh, for, our, for the previous Alice and Bob uh, some um, exam labels, and then we want to when, then we want to learn to classify the rest of the users, which have data but not uh, but not labels necessarily. And so they have features and not labels. Uh, so, uh, so a little bit of background. Uh, Hannes covered this, uh, this uh, very well, so I won't uh, uh, I won't delve into my detail. But uh, basically, uh, the pre previous approaches uh, I started with uh, distributed learning, where devices compute the grad gradients and to aggregate those gradients to update a common model. Um, then uh, later approaches tried to do federated learning. Uh, basically, uh, they tried to exchange gradients with uh, uh, often with a central service, but uh, also between themselves, and aggregating those gradients uh, yield, um, le helped learn a co a common models. Uh, yeah, this uh, increased privacy because we, um, devices would not disseminate uh, their own data. Uh, but on the gradients, and uh, finally, there are uh, there are more uh, recent advancement on the field of uh, decentralized learning, or gossip learning, is like gossip learning, where devices uh, update their models and then they exchange parts of their uh, parameter space with other devices. So basically, uh, devices average uh, their learning parameters. Uh, however, when we are moving uh, to the edge, then there are um, even with gossip learning, there are several problems. Uh, first of all, at most uh, the each device has one, at most one uh, data sample like that user's profile. So uh, learning uh, training models are, uh, are very informative. Uh, furthermore, um, typical learning schemes uh, consider that uh, devices communicate uh, or can communicate on demand. Let's say that I want to send some data point to device B, uh, then this um, and then I should be able to do it. However, in the real world, in the in the at the edge, this does not hold true. Uh, users go online, offline, uh, have limited accessibility, bandwidth problems, and so on. And um, and also this uh, and also the typical learning schemes do not account for underlying relations, uh, whereas uh, in reality we can have um, uh, a common concept is that uh, holds in real world network networks is homophily, which uh, often helps. Um, uh, it helps improve uh, classification. Uh, homophily basically is the concept that uh, uh, linked devices, or let's say that their corresponding users, users should exhibit similar attributes because uh, this drives them to make them friends. And this is a very well uh, observed phenomenon in uh, in a lot of so in social networks, but it even holds true in genomic networks and so on. Uh, so to leverage homophily. Uh, a com uh, what uh, we um, we employed the concept of graph neural networks. I presume that uh, given the previous presentation, so we are already a little bit familiar with this. But I'll give a I'll provide a brief overview here, uh, just uh, uh, to ha have the, con the contextual understanding needed for to understand uh, the rest of the work. Uh, so uh, basically, graph neural networks extract um, uh, embeddings for all nodes uh, in uh, in a graph or network. Uh, where nodes uh, in the context of uh, edge learning are the devices. And uh, then uh, for each device, uh, basically an aggregation uh, operation is performed. Uh, this is uh, called graph convolution, it has many names. Uh, basically, this is a type that averages or uh, performs a similar aggregation operation in the neighborhood of uh, each uh, device or node. And uh, then uh, the, uh, the, uh, the diffused embeddings or the aggregated or whatever you want to call them are used to make predictions. So, for example, with additional edge layers. Uh, so, uh, the, this is the, the basic concept of graph neural networks. Uh, I, present, uh, I present here a, a specific architecture, which is uh, all my, it has uh, results close to state of the art. Uh, it, uh, it lags behind by half a uh, half point percent. Uh, but it's very easy conceptually to, to understand and is uh, one of the more popular ones. So basically this, uh, uh, this architecture uh, has, a has a prediction module, a two layer uh, perceptron uh, at the bottom. And uh, then it has a propagation module in which uh, predictions uh, H0, uh, H0 are uh, diffused through the graph. Uh, the whole point is that this is done with um, the diffusion steps, um, the similar diffusion steps as uh, uh, a well-known method called personalized page rank, which uh, 
perform the averaging, but also bias the result a little bit uh, to be towards H0. And this, and the, this type of diffusion is um, uh, performed uh, for uh, main layers, like, let's say for 10 layers, which is uh, the most common setting. And uh, learn models, uh, and, and uh, this, uh, this model uh, learns basically to perform classification. Um, of course, this type of model uh, is trained end to end, but uh, recent works, uh, recent works have found that this uh, that does not necessarily need to hold true, and they have uh, proposed uh, that um, uh, we should uh, do decou uh, decoupled learning. For decoupled learning, uh, basically, uh, we need to first uh, first learn a predictor and then learn to uh, learn to propagate. And uh, for uh, decoupled graphing networks, the propagation step. It basically involves calculating the, the error and propagating both uh, the predictive labels and the predictive the predictions and uh, the the errors through the uh, through the graph. Uh, this, here I present uh, the formulas, but uh, it's, it's not important to understand them in uh, that much detail. And uh, the important part is that uh, the propagation is independent of uh, the of the train. So to see how the coupled graphing network uh, um, can be organized. Uh, we have a prediction module on the bottom, and then uh, from uh, its predictions H0, uh, we calculate some errors, we propagate the errors, and then we make a trade-off between uh, the errors and uh, the predictions. And then, we and then we also propagate the diffuse or smooth or whatever you want to think about uh, the, um, uh, the trade-off to, to create a new estimation. Okay. So uh, basically, this structure uh, takes uh, the predictive model and uh, improves its performance by taking into account uh, real-world uh, relations. And uh, the, the idea of our work was to decentralize this. So basically, uh, to decentralize this, then we can we can say that the predictive module can be trained with uh, uh, with uh, existing practices. For example, it, uh, we could uh, train it with cost learning or uh, deploy a pre-trained uh, module. And uh, then we can also perform. The, um, and then the question is how to perform the decentralized implementation. So basically, uh, so basically, the question is how to make the propagation steps decentralized because uh, uh, calculating errors and uh, performing trade-offs are uh, easy operations to perform on each device. Okay. So uh, to perform the propagation, we introduced a concept now uh, called uh, decentralized graph signals. Uh, basically, this is a, these are time evolving matrices of vector elements, and um, the signal at uh, each time step. Uh, tries to estimate uh, a final uh, vector uh, by each uh, other device. Uh, the important part of this uh, of this scheme, uh, I, I don't want you to try to understand the uh, mathematical details, is that uh, basically uh, the first part, of the, uh, the first uh, uh, the, the bolded uh, part, uh, it considers a communication, uh, a time evolving communication matrix. Uh, basically, it has values of one if uh, two nodes are interacting and zero otherwise. So basically, updates are performed when uh, on the, only when the nodes interact uh, or communicate. And uh, the second uh, equation basically performs for the propagation scheme of personalized page rank. It's just uh, like written uh, to be compatible with uh, the whole the whole definitions. Uh, so the important part of these decentralized graph signals is that if uh, the co if communications are um, uh, distributed uh, uh, are um, basically um, are extracted with the same distribution uh, for each edge. So basically, user, uh, users have the same probability to communicate, for example. Uh, then we end up calculating the main diagonal of, uh, of the decentralized graph signal, uh, which is um, basically can be organized basically as a new matrix. Uh, then it satisfies the equation we needed to, to satisfy about uh, the, the, the um, decoupled uh, propagation step. Uh, so, using this implementation, uh, to, to implement this, uh, we can see that uh, each uh, device uh, needs to keep track only of corresponding rows of uh, the decentralized graph signal, and uh, these uh, have only little, uh, only few non-zero elements that are equal to the number of communicating devices. Uh, so, and, uh, the, and uh, also rows are updated only when the device communicate. So, all this, uh, all this uh, uh, jargon, uh, essentially, uh, ends up um, uh, being summarized in that the devices work independently and synchronously to converge to, a desire, to the desired limit. Um, so, uh, given that we implemented the propagation step uh, this way, uh, then we tried uh, also uh, for different uh, ways to, uh, to train the predictive uh, uh, module. Uh, first is just to propagate the training labels, uh, which uh, uh, whatever uh, training labels are available, we, this, can, this can be very few in number. 
and then deploying a pre-trained module uh, on the same uh, training labels, uh, performing gossip learning to train, and also uh, in, in a little bit we tried uh, uh, to be a little bit clever uh, to try to exchange synthetic examples instead of performing uh, gossip learning and uh, learn on the synthetic examples. And uh, the idea here is that if, uh, for example, I, um, uh, nodes uh, propagate only their predictions to their neighbors and only one time their um, uh, the whole feature space, then uh, we can have um, uh, reduced communication costs. Uh, so to experiment with all this, uh, we uh, simulated uh, several peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, we used uh, some attributed graphs often used to uh, assess the efficacy of graph neural networks. Uh, we had uh, we set a 10% chance of neighbors to communicate per time period. Uh, this could uh, be any number really. It just uh, change it just scales uh, the axis, uh, the horizontal axis of how quickly the approaches converge. And uh, we use the center receive acknowledge protocol, which uh, where uh, communicating devices uh, uh, communicating devices uh, send some par some parameters, receive parameters, and then uh, uh, just uh, send an acknowledge message that uh, everything has been received. Uh, for all experiments, we uh, we tried uh, to have uh, 500 nodes with known labels, and then we basically uh, measured the accuracy on the rest. So, for the concerning hyperparameters, we used some very common uh, hyperparameters, like the um, uh, the first uh, two lines of parameters are very widely accepted for graph neural networks. Uh, and uh, for um, the um, uh, and uh, the, for the gossip uh, setting, we just uh, performed 40 training epoch, uh, epochs per device after each communication before changing parameters. Uh, so the dataset we used so had um, between 3,000 and uh, 20,000 nodes, and uh, three to four ages per node, uh, three to five ages per node, uh, on average. And we had a uh, different number of features and uh, class labels. Uh, uh, and uh, we had, uh, and here is the, the accuracy scores. So basically, uh, only deploying the uh, only using the pre-trained model, which does not involve any type of communication. Um, it was not uh, that uh, uh, it was outperformed by adding the propagation, which is the third column. Uh, in fact, adding the propagation uh, was the, the best uh, approach, uh, but uh, it may not always be possible. Uh, and uh, the important part is that uh, gossip learning by itself uh, could not uh, provide meaningful predictions, which is uh, which we expected it in part. Uh, because uh, each device uh, basically has one sample to learn from, and this is very uninformative. Um, and uh, okay, so uh, what is important to note here is that uh, gossip learning plus propagation uh, added a little bit of predictive accuracy compared to only simply propagating labels, despite gossip learning not being very informative on its own in this setting. And our, uh, our synthetic examples, uh, the, our practice of uh, exchanging synthetic samples, uh, the last column uh, that is, uh, give the same results approximately with uh, gossip learning plus propagation, uh, which is important because if we compare these uh, these two approaches, then um, if we try to compare the, the communication cost uh, between uh, each, uh, between devices, then uh, the last approach uh, just sends packets of maximum 34 kilobytes uh, in size, whereas um, uh, gossip learning plus propagation uh, tend to send packets of uh, uh, approximately almost two megabytes. Uh, of course, there are ways to reduce uh, this type of communication uh, cost for gossip learning. Um, there have been many approaches proposed, but uh, these uh, also reduce convergence speed. Um, so overall, uh, the highlights of uh, this type of, uh, of our research uh, basically can be summarized uh, are basically summarized in this slide that um, we introduced a decentralized graph neural network uh, propagation uh, protocol. Uh, it uh, drastically improves pre-trained models, and uh, this is basically the best uh, practice. And uh, it all, they also improve gossip learning. And um, uh, we also reduce uh, gossip communication costs by exchanging uh, synthetic examples. And uh, what is important to note is that uh, this approach is suited to, suited to peer to peer networks with limited bandwidth uh, because uh, devices may not communicate at regular intervals, but uh, it just it, it only suffice, it, it suffices to just on average communicate uh, a little bit. Uh, so for future work, uh, we are interested in uh, like improving the basic gossip learning algorithm, hopefully reaching comparable uh, or at least half the predictive ability of uh, the, of the pre-trained model. And when only these examples, uh, only one example is presented per device. And uh, we, are, we also plan to experiment on uh, real-time evolving attributed graphs. 
so thank you for your attention. You can find uh, the implementation of Fiber or the concept discussed in this work uh, in this GitHub repository. And um, uh, feel free to drop us an email if you're interested uh, interested in some aspects of work. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions if we have time. Uh, I think I. Yeah, we have some time. Yes. Thank you very much, Manios. Any questions? Um, okay, I have one. So I didn't really capture how you create the synthetic data. Can you add a little talk about it? Okay, uh, so uh, for the uh, for the experiments, you mean, right? Uh, so yes. the, the synthetic data. Yes. Okay. So basically, what we did is that in each uh, device, uh, we basically used all the all the data of their neighbors. So I have, uh, let's say, friends, and I used uh, the data of my friends. The important part is that uh, for uh, since many of my friends uh, may not have uh, labels, uh, labels, then we use the predictive, the current predictions of their labels, and and we and continuously change uh, those labels. Okay. I hope this okay. Was... And this is much more efficient regarding communication cost with respect to gossip. Yes, because because basically we just exchange the predictive labels on yes. each uh, communication step instead of exchanging model parameters, which can be many, mm -hmm. like the, yes, the complexity sure. of the you know, Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. You're Any other questions? Okay, so if there is no, we can go with the next presentation, which is going to be given by Adrian Popescu from French Alternative Energies and Atom uh, Atomic Energy Commission. So Adrian is going to talk about class incremental learning without memory. Uh, so can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. It says it, it is being shared. It didn't okay. come yet. <laughs> so. Uh, still not there. Uh, oh. No, just black. I see only black, and it says you are sharing, but there is no presentation. Okay. Let's try again. Green. Okay. Now it's frozen. Um, maybe you are muted. Yeah. We lost other. Okay. Meanwhile, if Yorgos is here. Your voice is here. Yes. Hello. Okay. Do you mind to switch? I don't <laughs> mind at all. Now and uh, and Adrian present. Okay, let's do like this. So we start with you, and then we continue with Adrian when he you know solve the technical problems. Let's see if I if I manage. Okay. You see my okay. screen? Yes. Yes, we do. Excellent.
All right. I hope you can hear me. You can see my screen. Yes, I my name, Excellent. Thanks. My name is Yorgos Yanakakis. I come from the University of Malta at the Institute of Digital Games, part uh, partner of AI for Media. Today, I will be talking about uh, what is called quality diversity optimization um, and how it has been used for media in particular. But in general, uh, I'll, I'll just introduce to you the, the family of algorithms that belong under this labeling, quality diversity, uh, which have been applied to many problems, uh, for problem solving tasks, for standard optimization tasks, all the way to creative AI tasks. Uh, for creating, as you will see, games, generating images, uh, creating aspects of architectural, uh, ur urban design tasks, uh, architect architectural tasks, and so on. So, a basic component of quality diversity is what is called divergent search, divergence in general. And divergence comes from the very fact that uh, we have been overrating uh, what is called objective uh, or a loss function. So let me be a bit more 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 concrete. Um, there are problems out there that they're, they're, they don't have a clear objective function, um, such as, for instance, let me, pick, let me pick an extreme scenario: how to become a celebrity, how to become Kim Kardashian, for instance, right? So how do you how do you, how do I design a loss function or an objective function that actually will solve this problem? And um, and maybe one way towards becoming a celebrity is, or the most obvious way is to actually uh, complete a you know, go through a uh, a school, I don't know, a theater school in Broadway, or maybe there's another way, uh, another building block for finding the solution, which is actually meeting the right person that knows some other person that knows a producer, for instance, right? So there, are, what I'm trying to say here is that there are some problems in, out there that they're really, really complex without, with a very hard to design objective function. So these, these problems usually are highly deceptive. And deceptive problem is evolution. Uh, and quality diversity and divergent search are inspired by evolutionary algorithms. They are inspired, sorry, by, by natural evolution. They are essentially a family of evolutionary algorithms uh, in the way that uh, natural evolutions have found many, many different diverse solutions to a particular problem like walking or running uh, in the same way we hope that algorithms will be able to find very very different solutions with equally high fitness or equally low loss functions let's say uh, values uh, that are very very different uh, to, to each other thereby diversity so deception essentially is is the fact uh, is, is, is a property of a problem in which uh, highly fit blocks or highly let's say um you know blocks of high quality when you recombine them can lead uh, search away from the global optimum so you might feel that a particular objective is taking you to the optimum but in many cases actually takes you away and a classical example is navigating in this sort of uh, highly deceptive maze whereas if you want to you know go towards a goal you obviously end up in a dead end whereas the solution is far away from that now Divergence essentially is the notion of ignoring the objective of a problem and instead reward intrinsic high level features of the solutions and um, divergent search has seen implementations as a notion has seen implementations in algorithms like novelty search, which was introduced back in uh, you know, 10 years ago by Lemon and Stanley. Um, these two people work at uh, OpenAI labs these days at OpenAI and um, Essentially, what novelty search is doing is to select the individuals based on how they diverse they are uh, with respect to, to each other. So it maintains a population uh, and a novel archive, and it tries to deviate essentially from the solutions it, it creates in the hope that through divergent search, it will be able to solve very complex problems that they are highly deceptive. Um, an algorithm we introduced some time ago uh, is called surprise search, which essentially is temporal novelty. So uh, eventually you have a number of, you know, you have a population over time that you maintain its history. You come up with a number of behaviors, and then you have a predictive model that based on all this history of uh, behaviors over time that predicts where the behaviors are going to end up in the next generation in time stop time step t for instance 
then once you have those predictive models about uh, where my expected behaviors are going to be, you have the actual generation and you calculate through a model of deviation how much away, you know, how much how much deviation there is from your expectation. So surprise essentially is deviation from expectation. And essentially you reward behaviors, solutions to a problem that surprise the algorithm itself, that deviate from um, from what is expected based on history. So it's it, it in a sense, surprise is the temporal novelty. So uh, it's very similar to the notion of novelty search, but with a with a temporal um, element. And, and we've seen it working very, very well for solving problems uh, before going to examples about, you know, creative examples of how these algorithms work. I can show you some examples of how they operate in um, standard robot navigation. So you have standard objective search here. In the middle, you have novelty search and you have surprise search. These blue dots are essentially where robots end up uh, going, trying to solve the problem of going from this point here, that's the start to the end goal, which is up here. And as you are able to see, both novelty and surprise search are able to, to, to sort of explore the search space of uh, possibilities, the behavioral search space, and uh, ultimately find solution to such problems, which are benchmark problems uh, for evolutionary computation. Now, um, you can what you can do in top of uh, standard on top of standard surprise search is to add constraints, like you know, make sure that essentially what you generate through um, surprise search is, for instance, it meets some certain quality constraints criteria, and for instance, you can apply. Uh, constraints surprise search to generate weapons in a first person shooter. What do you gain by that? Well, you, you know, in this particular example, your constraints are the playability of a weapon, some certain qualities of a weapon that, you know, it's balanced, for instance. And at the same time, uh, you have the element of surprise search that creates a very, very diverse and weird looking weapon. So in that way, you, you guarantee both, let's say, quality and diversity. Why is that important? Because game designers can actually get inspired from these creative capacities of uh, constraint surprise search and utilize this these weapons right so again uh, this is an application of divergent search for uh, for creative tasks let me move on and i'll move on to what is called quality diversity i've been talking about what divergent search is which is a critical element of quality diversity but uh, i'll, I'll now, in this in this session of the of the presentation, I'll introduce you to the concept of quality diversity, which is basically its premise is that um, a strong convergent force, let's say, of an objective, can hide promising areas of the search space. So, if you have, you know, if you if your search is driven by a particular loss function that optimizes something in particular, then you might actually miss an opportunity to find other. Uh, areas in the search space that can give you equally good behaviors or good solutions uh, that they are different. So the goal here of quality diversity is to uncover as many diverse behavioral niches as possible. Each niche is represented by a candidate of the highest possible quality of, let's say, the minimum loss or highest fitness uh, for that particular niche. And uh, the, the algorithm, the, the idea was introduced by, again, the group of uh, Ken Stanley, uh, quality diversity maintains a large collection of solutions that they are as diverse and ha as high performing as possible. So you see, you have a quality measure here, which is your fitness, your your loss function. Um, you try to maximize, and you have some behave some characterization of of whatever you're generating. Like let's say you know a robot that that learns to walk, right? So essentially, with quality diversity, you're trying to find high quality solutions, but diverse solutions in this multimodal um, search space. Um, the most representative algorithm of quality diversity is called Mapelitz. It was introduced a few years back by um, Jean Baptiste Mouret and Jeff Klune. Essentially, what Mapelitz is doing is is compressing a high dimensional space into two feature space you have a map of the leads each one a lead in each cell of this map uh, is characterized by two features let's say you know um, if, if we're talking about a level design task for instance it could be 
feature one could be how many gaps you have in a level in the platform level and feature two could be how many blue cells you have for instance things features features one and two or it could be more are things that you care about you you're actually care about illuminating while while you're searching in the search space and i'll show you more examples uh, because you know that that description might might not be uh that clear but uh, it will become clearer when you see the examples of how how uh mapalates work now when it comes to quality diversity it has been the idea of creating diverse solutions that are as uh, as optimal as possible let's say um has you know that the, the that that basic element has made it to algorithms popular algorithm like go explore which was uh, uh go explore essentially solved montezuma's revenge which was one of the hardest if not the hardest game for deep qn uh, to play based on pixels and one of the elements of uh, go explore is essentially quality diversity is a notion that the algorithm searches it's a reinforcement learning algorithm, but it searches in state representations uh, that have diverse uh, qualities, let's say, you know, uh, essentially, Go Explore is built in the notion of quality diversity, and it's a reinforcement learning algorithm that was just published in Nature um, a month back, I think, it's only, it's a very recent algorithm, and it's essentially uh, solves uh, very, very difficult deceptive problems that feature planning elements like uh, playing uh, Montezuma's Revenge. Right. Um, now, quality diversity has been used not only for playing games, but for designing, let's say, robots that are able to go from point A to B or, you know, in the fastest possible way. And in my lab, we have been uh, creating hybrids of map elites, uh, fusing uh, map elites with novelty search, with surprise search and com combinations of these uh, algorithms. Uh, and to our great uh, interest and, and surprise, let's say, these algorithms work, work very, very well in the sense that they find, they, they design those soft robots that you see here, that they have uh, different elements, they have bones, they have sort of soft tissues. Uh, they put together all the cells so that the robot can move as fast as possible. And it turns out that, you know, with through divergent search and quality diversity, you can do it very, very well when it comes to the exploration of the search space. Um, another application of quality diversity is in architecture uh, along the lines of uh, AI for media. These are really recent results um, under, yeah, they were just published actually uh, last month. So what you see here is the map uh, of the map leads algorithm that I was talking about and two design features on the X axis, on the Y axis, you see ground space index and on the um, X axis, you, you see floor space index. Essentially, what we're trying to do is to utilize map elites for designing urban spaces. Um, and ground, essentially, uh, ground space is the amount of ground that is available, floor space is the amount of floor that exists through the buildings that we design. And what you're seeing here is the iterations of the iteration of the algorithm of the map elite algorithm, uh, where it finds different solutions, diverse solutions with high fitness. Fitness in this case is comfort that is calculated through a surrogate model of, of comfort, right? So we try to maximize comfort, but at the same time, we want to display, illuminate the search space in this 2D map, as you see here. Why is that beautiful for me? Because as an architect, I can actually see this map and select which areas, um, which highly fit solutions my algorithm has found that they display different properties ground space versus floor space right so um i think it's a very interesting way of visualizing and interacting with algorithms a very expressive way of actually interacting with algorithms right and and what you see here is a, a part of a map elite that was you know made in a in the last generation um and we actually have applied this idea of arc elites so map elites for architecture for redesigning existing cities like Boston, what you see here is the Harvard University with red, red is a frozen area, it's the campus of Harvard, with green is, you know, surroundings, housing, uh, buildings around that we can actually change so that the overall area of Harvard um, gets better with with, uh, with regards to comfort levels, right, for, uh, you know, for, for extreme uh, wind scenarios and so on. So you can redesign cities using map leads, uh, you know, to obtain 
um, better um, better confidence le le levels for uh, Harvard students and um, professors. Now, a final algorithm I want to talk to you about is is, is called uh, Delanox, and we've applied it uh, parts of it in um, or versions of this in AI for Media. Um, Delanox stands for Deep Learning Novelty Explorer, and essentially is the combination of deep learning, um, unsupervised learning, autoencoders, uh, variational autoencoders, and evolution and diversity search. So essentially, we had we introduced this sort of two-phase iterative algorithm where a novelty search or aspects of, the, of divergent search could be used to explore the search space, and then aspects of um, you know um, unsupervised learning like um, Denoising autoencoders could compress the space and could provide the fitness function for for novelty search. So essentially, the algorithm is iterative. So it it it, it uh, alternates exploration and transformation phases, and it creates uh, increasingly complex uh, images. Let's say uh, in this particular in, in this particular case, uh, spaces. But it could actually be used for anything that any any creative generative tasks task in AI. So it is interesting. What is beautiful about this algorithm is that it, 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 it learns from its own creations and it gradually iteratively increases the size of the of the neural network through a neural architecture search. Let's say back in the days it wasn't such a term didn't exist. But eventually it, it augments the, the architecture of the neural network over time, thereby creating increasingly more complex um, creations. Um, and uh, along the lines of Prisma project, we have been applying this um, similar similar architectures for uh, for creating buildings in Minecraft that they look like sort of Zaha Hadid buildings, but they are also very novel, very different, as much as much different, as much divergent as possible from from Zaha Hadid um, with a partner partner in Prisma. So. Um, I hope it was it was clear. Uh, very first introduction, but you can read more in these uh, papers that were published along the lines of AI for Media. This is early days for us. Uh, this uh, quality diversity tasks that we're uh, tasked with in the AI for Media, but uh, already we have managed to publish a number of papers. And um, if you oh, if you care about AI and games and its application to games, um, we run a, a summer school in July. In, um, in Copenhagen, where you can actually meet people, prof industry professionals from uh, DeepMind, Unity, King, uh, Ubisoft, all the big players are actually partnering with us. And, and you can read uh, more about AI and games in, in my book, which is uh, available for free over, over here. Now, now, if you care about, if you're interested more about quality diversity, uh, there's a great repository, GitHub, uh, that you see over here, uh, which is up to date. Um, and um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yorgos. It was an excellent presentation. Any questions to Yorgos? Please stop sharing. Okay. So, Alexei, uh, um, thank you very much for your presentation. I just have a quick question. Have you considered uh, maybe uh, more uh, artistic application tasks like uh, to design maybe tools? Well, you have was speaking about architecture, but um, for artists, um, I think the diversity and novelty must be important. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I think I think no. The algorithm, quality diversity algorithms, the family of these algorithms is applicable for both creative tasks and problem solving tasks, as I've, I've seen in uh, as you've seen in, in several examples. So, but I think the very fact that you can illuminate, uh, as as the author called it, you can illuminate the search space of the possibilities of the varying possibilities across a number of features that you, as a designer, can you think are, are interesting like for instance if you're an artist you might want to look at you know the the redness and the blueness of a, of a painting for instance right and then your objective function could be something different and 
And in a similar fashion as you did it with, as you saw it with architecture, you can display obviously different paintings and you can even interactively uh, work with map elites. Uh, I mean, there are versions of map elites that they are essentially interactive evolution, right? So you can actually change things and then iteratively work together with the algorithm. So yeah, I, I, I mean, in, in, our, in our lab, we haven't applied that for visual art, but we have applied these algorithms for designing games or levels of games and so on. So yeah, it is a very promising uh, domain, definitely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, I, I guess there is no other question. Sure, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, Adrian, yes. Yes, now we see your presentation. Perfect. Okay, uh, sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, the, the third no, computer no is the good one. Okay, so um, I'll speak about uh, class incremental learning uh, in a um, setting where there is no, no memory available. So this is uh, work done by Eden Beluada uh, and uh, joined with me and Yonis Kanos, who is her, um, the other PhD advisor. Um, so what is this memory less thing? So it's a setting where we need to learn new classes uh, in absence of uh, any memory of past ones. So we have examples of application like medical application it can be embedded systems. It can be uh, learning faces from, from the web in a continual way. And we don't have access to, to what happens in the past, to, to data from the past. So the major challenge here is catastrophic forgetting where, or by basically we learn new classes uh, very well and we, um, the, the network forgets uh, whatever it learned uh, previously. So we have a toy example here in which at the end, the model is assumed to have learned uh, six classes. It learns two, two and two in each uh, incremental state. Uh, so in each state, the classes which are which are learned, the latest ones are well learned and well recognized, whereas the other ones are forgotten because uh, there is no replay for them since there is no data for them. Um, if uh, we want to see what happens in terms of classification, we uh, have a chunk of uh, the, the LSVRC data set in uh, incremental mode. Uh, so we uh, display the um, weights which are uh, which are available available for new classes and for past classes. So what we can see is that uh, actually the forgetting happens in the weights layer, since the the weights of the past classes are much smaller than those of uh, new classes. So when we uh, do the um, dot products with uh, the features. Uh, of course, the new classes will be favored and uh, all the predictions will go towards them. So we need to do something in order to, to boost the, um, the weights of, uh, of uh, past classes. So wh what we try to do is very simple is that we said, okay, let's see if uh, we can uh, make the model evolve and still be able to use the initial weights of uh, each class when it was first learned, so when it was new. So to do this, what we propose is a simple standardization um, operation, and which is uh, possible because the weights are um, distributed, uh, uh, follow a distribution, a uh, Gaussian distribution, which basically says, the, which basically allows for for standardization. We have some examples on uh, on this slide of the distributions. Um, so we did that. We uh, we froze the past class weights uh, throughout the incremental state. So what we add to the uh, classical uh, schema that I showed is that the, um, the, the upper line where we simply store for each class uh, its weights mask. So it's uh, in, uh, for instance, in ResNet 18, which is used here, it's uh, 512 floats for, per class. So that's that's all that we are adding, adding in, term of, in terms of, uh, of memory. And then whenever we are in a given state, we are reusing uh, the initial weights of, uh, of each class. Uh, when we here, uh, Eden was uh, put some uh, small equations, so basically show the, the formula of standardization, which is pretty much nothing. Um, then the prediction scores, uh, so we, we do the standardization of uh, the past weights and the 
what we do is that we reuse them afterwards and we also introduced a term which uh, exploits the mean uh, predictions of uh, each model uh, over the train set so this is done in order to give all models equal chances because some of the models might have prediction with a larger magnitude than others and we, we use the term on the right so on the on equation three to uh, to level uh, to level that up uh, now we have the, the shampoo um, slide where we show what we have we have before um, standardization of initial weight, so to the left and to the right, we have what happens with uh, the magnitudes of uh, the weights of past classes after standardization. So we see that uh, by applying standardization to both new and uh, past classes, we get to have um, more or less balanced, uh, or actually quite quite well balanced uh, weights between uh, between those two types of uh, of classes. So the classification, the incremental classification, is uh, it's fair or fairer than uh, in a classical setting. Uh, we have a second method which is a bit older, which is very very simple. So in this one, we are doing the simplest transfer learning. Uh, um, we are applying the, the transfer learning approach to incremental learning. Where we learn a um, model on the first batch. We freeze, uh, we freeze that model, and then we train a shallow classifier. So in our case, it would be near SVMs, uh, based on the first on the on the initial model for any class that comes uh, after. So that's pretty much it. Then we we compare the the predictions of the SVMs. So this is again, this is well applicable to uh, uh, memoryless setting because we don't need to have uh, we, we we don't need to have access to uh, past examples since there is no model update after the initial um, state incremental state. We run experiments uh, with uh, four data sets. So we have uh, ILS here, CVG phase, a part of VG phase, and a part of landmarks, which all have one thousand classes, and we. For comparability with existing uh, methods, we also run with uh, Cypher uh, 100, which is uh, often used in incremental learning. So we have some statistics of uh, of the classes of the data sets here, and we trained with uh, a number of states, uh, incremental states, which is 10, 20, and 50. So basically, we split the data set in 10 uh, parts, 20 parts, or 50 parts. Uh, we compute uh, performance based on top five uh, mean incremental accuracy. So ba this basically means that we don't look at the accuracy. We, we look at the accuracy from the second state on. We considering the first state is not incremental. So this is again some some standard measure. And we also propose an aggregated measure which uh, basically computes uh, a sort of mean over all the um, uh, over all the settings. So we compare this with learning without forgetting, which is the basic uh, method on upon which um, incremental other incremental learning are built, uh, and with some uh, variants of it, which uh, including uh, one so the reference number five solution, which is uh, CVPR uh, 2019 paper, which gives very good results in a setting with memory, and it's also pretty good here. And then different versions of what we do. So uh, the the blue ones um, stand for uh, uh, standardization of initial weights, and the what is that? So the second method that we proposed. Um, so one thing that is interesting to to note is that learning without forgetting is very good on Cypher, uh, but false. Uh, so its performance uh, is not that good on uh, the large scale data sets. Um, so we try to to look at what happens there, and it seems to be a matter of uh, scalability of uh, distillation because learning without forgetting is based on distillation. So, uh, and this is also the case for uh, for Lucier. Knowing that Lucier adds some uh, some more uh, some more tricks uh, beyond distillation, so it uh, it scales up better. Uh, inversely, the, the the methods we proposed are uh, don't have good results at uh, small scale, so for Cypher, but uh, work much better for uh, the the large scale uh, data sets. What's in a way annoying is that uh, if we look at only at uh, large scale uh, examples, uh, um, 
the best results are obtained in the simplest method, so which is uh, diesel. So the uh, the the, the application starts learning to, to incremental learning, and uh, uh, basically what this says in a way is that we've done some complicated thing, com quite a few complicated things in uh, incremental learning, which are which still fall behind a very simple baseline, and uh, we've run some new experiments. Uh, and we, we uh, at, at scale we, with other methods and at scale we, we still don't get better results than, than this. So again, this is kind of annoying because it's been two years now so we're trying to, to do better than that and uh, in class incremental learning without memory, but we, we don't get there. So uh, we also tried the, uh, SLDA, which is um, also based on uh, transfer learning, but with a, a bit more complicated uh, scheme so that they have some, some additions to it and uh, it's uh well it gives better results than the other methods but it's still uh, it's still behind the uh, design so uh again simple methods are mining powerful um uh, what we see is that uh contrary to uh, let's say popular wisdom uh we don't actually need to have the distillation uh, um, um part because the um, most of the catastrophe forgetting happens in the classification layer. So if we, we can work without uh, distillation and uh, basically uh, try to um, refine the classification layer to get some uh, some better results so to reduce catastrophic forgetting. Uh, so we are we are still trying to convince the community about this. Well, we, we are getting there, but it's a slow process. So there is code and data. Uh, available on Git on Adam's GitHub. Uh, if you have any questions beyond this uh, workshop, uh, do not hesitate to contact her or me in the, the future. So that's it from my side. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, any questions to Adrian? So. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes, great, great. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I have a, I have a, a pair of questions. Uh -huh. uh, the first one is: uh, Is there any evidence that uh, catastrophic forgetting? I mean, the main responsible for catastrophic forgetting is the finite classifier. And, and this is the first question. And, and the second one is: Is uh, if the SVM it is required? or just a simple linear classifier is enough? Uh, so for the first question, uh, we have uh, empirical evidence. So uh, the, well, we can discuss, we can take this offline Federico, afterwards, but uh, the, there was one graph, I don't know if I'm still sharing or not. Okay. Uh, uh, so if you look at, uh, at the graph to the left, you can see that uh, the the weights of past classes are basically uh, random. Or well, actually, this, the the aggregate the, the the magnitude, but we, we looked at the weights and they are random. And this happens because there is no replay for them. So, um, since uh, in each state we uh, the, the system learns based on only on uh, new samples or of, of samples of new classes, uh, uh, the weights of past classes have stand no chance to to, to be learned. So they they are they are random. Um, we don't have a theoretical explanation. We try to to find something, but we for for now we we don't have it. Um, and uh, more so in terms of uh, weights, what we see is that as soon as we add some samples, so a limited memory for samples of past classes, uh, the um, the effect of uh, catastrophic forgetting uh, is very much reduced. So this mm -hmm. goes uh, towards more uh, empirical evidence that the, the um, uh, forgetting happens, uh, let's say, majoritarily on in the in the weights uh, space. This is not to say that it doesn't happen on the feature space. Of, of course, the features evolve themselves, and uh, there is some uh, uh, some forgetting there. But uh, we 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 also have it on the on the weight space in the weight space. Now concerning the the classifiers, uh, we can basically use any linear classifier. So it's we, we use SVM because we well, 
it's, it's the first to talk about, but uh, there are other people, uh, I think, using uh, other classifiers and they, they work pretty well. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you. I think we can proceed with the next talk, uh, which is going to be given by Fabrizio Sebastiani, who is from National Research Council. So Fabrizio is going to present cross-lingual sentiment quantification. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, let me check. Uh, uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we do. Thanks. Okay, so um, this work is joint work with my colleagues Andrea Esri and Alejandro Moreo. Uh, actually, it's a, um, it's a work where uh, I'm touching on two issues that are, let's say, uh, important to this workshop. One is transfer learning as represented by cross-linguality, and the other is quantification. So it's actually learning about quantities instead of learning um, about uh, individual entities. So essentially here, uh, the, the, the basic, so we start from sentiment classification, which is uh, sentiment classification in text. Uh, so it's, it's a fairly well-known task, the, the idea of, uh, of classifying text uh, that uh, carry opinions according to whether they carry a positive opinion or a negative opinion about a certain object. Okay, so it's it's a fairly well investigated task, and but we are adding two two different uh, slants here. So one, uh, the first slant is we are adding cross linguality. Uh, cross linguality is important when we have no training data for the for a certain number of languages, target languages for which we want to issue, issue the predictions. But we have the training data for, for the same set of classes for other languages, which we call the source languages. And this task is very, very important. Uh, why? So in, in the realm of text, uh, we now know that we can obtain, uh, you know, very high uh, levels of performance through the uh, application of, 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 you know, large uh, models that we have seen in the literature in recent times. The problem is that the languages for which reap the benefits for these large models are just a handful. Okay, So there are thousands, literally more than 3,000 uh, 3, languages which are spoken around the world. Okay, But for many, for most of these languages, there are essentially no uh, data. So there are very little data to support these very large models. Okay? And so it has been estimated that less than 1% of uh, the languages which are spoken around the world, you know, um, account for more than half of the data resources that are, that are available. And I'm talking both of unlabeled and labeled data. Okay. So here we are actually, actually taking about labeled data and we are talking about the idea of transferring the knowledge we uh, we acquire for, for uh, high resource languages to the lower resource languages. And the second slant we add is we, are, we don't talk of classification here, we talk of quantification, learning about quantities. So quantification is, is essentially the, the case when we do not need to predict a class for the individual documents, but all we need to predict is the percentages of documents in each class which is a simpler task, but which, which carries different, different types of problems. Okay. So the, this combination had never been discussed in the literature. What we are doing here is just to try to uh, put together um, well-proven approaches to it in order to establish important baselines and to figure out where the kind of, what kind of uh, levels of performance we can obtain from, from in these kind of uh, contexts. Okay. So let me um, just discuss learning to quantify. So the idea here is that uh, in, in many applications of classification, we are not interested in the individual, uh, in the individual predictions. Okay? So say we, we might have a question such as among the tweets concerning the next US presidential elections, what is the percentage of pro-democrat ones? 
Here, you know, we don't care about the label of an individual tweet. Okay, so the, the only reason why we care about the individual tweets is that they allow us to compute these percentages. So the interest here is at the macro level, you know, at the percentage level rather than the individual level. So in, uh, in these cases, we, uh, the, the kind of uh, supervised task is not supervised classification, but is what we typically call supervised prevalence estimation, supervised percentage estimation, or quantification or learning to quantify as that's been called to. So this is a task which has been studied across different fields. It's not a very well known task. It's fairly unknown and there is very, a lot of lack of awareness about it, especially among potential users, such as in the computational social science or, or the like. But this task has been studied and has given rise to learning methods and evaluation measures which are specific to it. So. In a sense, it's a task which should be considered as a task on its own and not just a byproduct of classification. So the, the idea is that quantification can, of course, I mean, be defined as the task of approximating a true distribution via predicted distribution. Okay, so compute the distribution across the classes in a dat data set of unlabeled events. And as a result, you know, the evaluation measures that we are going to use for quantification are divergences. You know? Since these essentially evaluate how much a predicted distribution diverges from the true distribution. So one might wonder why, you know, the strategy of just classifying uh, all of the individuals and counting how many individuals fall in a certain class is not the optimal one. Well, you know, the reason is that a perfect classifier, of course, is, a per is also a perfect quantifier, let's say a perfect estimator of class prevalence. But the converse is not true. You know, a good classifier is not necessarily a good quantifier. And this very simple example shows it. You know, as a as a classifier, you know, we should prefer classifier H1 because it does it makes um, fewer mistakes. But as a quantifier, we should prefer classifier H2 because uh, essentially the it makes a more balanced uh, set of mistakes. And in terms of uh, when it comes to estimating class prevalence, you know, false positives and false negatives cancel each other out. Okay, so H2 is actually a perfect quantifier. So this makes a case for studying quantification as a task in its own right. You know? And of course, I mean, quantification, the need to perform quantification arises because of distribution shift, you know, because the fact that typically there is a shift, you know, between the class prevalences between um, between the class prevalences you, you witness in the training data and the class prevalences that you witness in the uh, test data, you know. And, and of course, I mean, distribution drift arises, you know, for many different reasons, you know. One is not stationarity of the environment across time and space. One, of course, is the presence of sample selection bias. Okay, so sometimes when, when generating a classifier for, for let's say, uh, capturing rare events, we tend to oversample the minority class. So we generate, you know, we generate a bias in the, you know, we artificially generate a distribution drift between the training set and, and the test set. Of course, I mean, active learning is another case. Okay, so when we learn, when we generate a training set via active learning, we generate a set that is not IID with respect to the distribution. Okay, so again, another cause of drift, you know. And the, the, the problem is that the distribution shift of distribution drift, as it is called, invalidates the IID assumption, you know, on which standard ML, standard machine learning algorithms are, are based, you know. And of course, I mean, using such algorithms, this means that may lead to suboptimal quantification accuracy. Here in this plot, we can see a number of uh, uh, quantification mechanisms, some good and some bad, okay? Because the, on the x-axis, we see the amount of distribution shift between training and test sample. On the y-axis, we see the amount of quantification error, okay? And the, the algorithms we should prefer are the ones that generate a flat curve, okay? So where the quantification error doesn't grow, you know, with the amount of distribution shift. 
And I call your attention on the CC algorithm, the classifying, the, the trivial classifying count strategy, you know, which as, as the plot shows, you know, is not a desirable uh, strategy, you know. Um, essentially here in this, um, um, so let, let me ju just comment on the fact that quantification is important in many contexts, especially because there are disciplines, you know, in human activity, which are inherently concerned with uh, aggregate data. You know, they don't care about individuals. Epidemiology is one, you know, uh, market research, social sciences is, is another, opinion research. I mean, all these disciplines don't care about individuals, okay? We only care about aggregate data. We only care about, uh, about quantities. Okay? And so if we want to cater for these disciplines, we should go for quantification and not for classification. Essentially here in this, uh, uh, in this work, we have combined you know, a number of quantification algorithms with a number of uh, transfer learning algorithms for, for, uh, for cross-linguality. And uh, here, you know, we've taken simple uh, proven classification algorithm. Classifying count is, of course, I mean, the trivial baseline. Probabilistic classifying count is just, you know, a variant with where we use expected counts instead of, uh, um, instead of uh, actual counts. Um, we, we use actually two other um, still simple, but uh, usually more successful strategies, which are adjust the classifying count and probabilistic adjusted classifying count, which basically amount to trying to correct the results of classifying count by the detected tendency of our classifier to generate more false positives and false, more false negatives. You know? So we essentially try to detect this tendency from the training set via k foil cross-validation, and we correct the, their estimates, you know, according to detected tendencies. We have also brought to bear a, a more complex method, a deep learning based method for quantification. It's called Quonet. It's, it's uh, something that uh, was, was published three years ago. And here the idea of Quonet is to set up a sort of a complex network in which we learn to produce um, sample embeddings. Okay, so by, me, by sample embeddings, I mean dense representations of the entire set upon which we um, upon which we want to predict uh, uh, prevalences. Okay, so and we generate these sample embeddings via observed posterior probabilities generated by a classifier, via the use of document embeddings, and via also the class prevalence estimated uh, estimated uh, by the simple aggregative methods that we have shown here. So let me come to cross-linguality. Cross-linguality is, of course, I mean, as I said, the case where we want to classify documents for target languages for which we have no training data. Okay. So we have training data for, for other for source languages, and we assume the set of classes to be the same. You know? So this is an instance, an instance of heterogeneous transfer learning because the feature spaces for the source uh, the source languages and the target languages are different okay? because the typically our features are going to be say either the words uh, that we find in the documents okay and so there is typically no overlap between a chinese document and an italian document in terms of features so one typical approach to cross-lingual classification consists in generating projections of the original source and target vectors okay from the original spaces into a shared language agnostic feature space, you know? And uh, here we have uh, taken uh, two fairly well-known approaches to doing these, these projections, uh, which are structural correspondence indexing and distributional correspondence indexing. And both approaches actually uh, in their, uh, in this view, the shared feature space in which we are going to to represent all of the documents, the share of the language agnostic feature space consists of what people call pivot terms. Okay, so these are highly predictive uh, pairs of uh, translation equivalent terms, you know, which tend to behave in a similar way 
in their respective languages and in the domain under consideration. So in sentiment related applications, you might think of terms such as excellent or masterpiece with their own uh, translations. And so you need essentially in order to work for to use these these methods, you need sort of a budget, you know, for for let's say a word translation oracle with a budget for a limited number of terms. And both methods, essentially what they do, they learn a matrix for each language that actually performs the mapping from the original vectors in the original spaces to the vectors in the shared space. And the difference between these two methods is actually in terms that they learn the matrix. Okay? The second, especially the, the second method, is based on the distribution hypothesis, you know, which is very important for text, which basically says that uh, words that have a similar meaning tend to co-occur frequently. So we have run some some experiments on uh, on on a standard data set for cross lingual sentiment classification, which involves four different languages, three different domains. So these are product reviews, you know. So it's reviews about books, DVDs, music, you know. And uh, so we have tried to combine the quantification algorithms that I've described with the uh, cross lingual projection methods that I've described. And uh, here we, in cross-lingual experimentation, typically what people do is to use English as the source language because it's the quintessential high resource language and uh, all other document, all other languages, the target uh, languages. So um, the, in order to evaluate this work, you need evaluation measures that, that uh, evaluate the divergence of a true distribution of a predicted distribution from from a true distribution and typical measures are divergence measures such as absolute error relative absolute error or or kullback leibler divergence and one important fact is that say in order to try to experiment a quantification algorithm you need to do some stress testing of it. So you need to test it under conditions in which the distribution of the classes in the training set is also very different, you know, from the distribution of the classes in the test set, because you want to test the ability of a quantifier to do accurate predictions also in cases in which you know, the test set might have drifted away a lot, you know, in terms of distribution drift from the typical um, prevalences that you could find in the test set. Okay. So essentially here, the, this is a summary of some of the results. You know, I'm presenting this only for the absolute error, but for relative absolute error and KLD are similar. Okay. So what I want to draw your attention especially to the uh, rightmost block, you know, because the rightmost block presents the results for using uh, DCI, distribution correspondence indexing, and the five different uh, quantifiers. So this DCI is our cross-linguality method, while the five methods below are the quantification methods. And here, um, one important, one interesting fact we found that DCI indeed is much better than the other cross linguality method, structural correspondence indexing. And we found out that PACC, the probabilistic adjusted classifying count, is usually the best performing quantification, but with the, the deep learning method trading from, from, uh, from behind. So, but the probably the most important um, uh, thing that I wanted to point out is the fact that as it uh, shows here you know if you look at the these results the average results for classifying count which is 0 0.92 0 0.092 and the average results from PACC it's uh, 0 0.033 is that by using quantification techniques instead of pure traditional classification techniques quantification error decreases by 64% okay so it's, it's a huge reduction, and this calls the attention on the fact that 
you know, when we want to learn about quantities, we should indeed, uh, you know, use mechanisms, you know, that are explicitly devised for learning about quantities and not use the standard uh, mechanisms, you know, classification mechanisms that, that were originally optimized for individual predictions. I think uh, this is it for my presentation and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Fabrizio. Any questions? Okay, I guess there is no questions. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so now it is time for our second guest presentation, which is going to be given by Rita Cucchiara from University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. Rita is going to talk about sustainable and privacy preserving action, action understanding in video. Rita, thank you very much for joining us today and it's, the floor is on yours. Yes, we can see the slides, but you are muted. You are still muted. Let me check if I can unmute. I cannot. Okay, now now it's better. Yes. Yeah, okay, yes. thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay. I just arrived because uh, I had my lecture until now. So in this, uh, um, how many time I have for my presentation? I don't listen. Sorry, you have time until ten past one. Hey, come on, too much. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, thanks again for uh, for the invitation. Uh, today, I uh, decided to present you two very new things that we are doing uh, here in Modena that are uh, probably not uh, the most important things for the new uh, deep learning architecture, but I think that we should discuss together about the two concepts about sustainability and the privacy preserving action analysis. I'm sure that uh, um, I tried to to put uh, in uh, uh, in presentation manner. Do you see again? Do you see the slides? Yes. Okay, good. Do you see all the slides or just only one? Or also the no, second? Perfect. Right now it's full screen for first slide. Perfect, perfect. Okay. So let's, uh, uh, in Modena, in, uh, uh, in our lab, uh, in, in Image Lab, uh, uh, we do a lot of different things, uh, but probably one of the th things that we are doing more uh, is actually uh, human action analysis uh, or human behavior understanding. Uh, it's a long story for us. In this last period, this last two years, we are working on together also with NVIDIA and uh, together with the Cineca Supercomputer Center in Italy and also in collaboration with uh, uh, other European labs uh, uh, through the Alice network uh, we, we are joined with. So um, I told you that uh, because uh, uh, this, uh, for instance, uh, this morning uh, um, we, uh, we pushed on, uh, on the web uh, a new research fellow position uh, together with Valencia. If you are interested in, uh, uh, in some uh, position, uh, we have many open positions. I'm sure that this is common for all of us, uh, but uh, I started uh, with uh, uh, this misinformation. Uh, uh, this so let's we talk about uh, action analysis in video. Uh, it's really a long story. I started working uh, more than 15 years ago with also the group of Lawrence uh, uh, talking about the soccer uh, uh, um, analysis. And we still are working in the same area for some companies, for instance. 
but uh, uh, action analysis is very useful uh, in many real uh, uh, application. This is two, three examples we are doing. From one side, uh, we are working for media analysis, for the other one, for human uh, robot interaction, for understanding the action of humans, uh, and uh, providing captioning and providing text uh, from, uh, from the action. The third application we are ongoing uh, is to understanding the action of the worker for um, safety of the worker uh, in some companies. So there are many, many different applications that now can be feasible uh, things uh, of uh, human uh, analysis and video understanding. And uh, uh, when we, we think about action analysis in general, we should divide uh, in three different categories. The first is action recognition, the simplest one. Uh, uh, kinetics is the most famous data set uh, for uh, doing uh, drawing, uh, understanding uh, many, many different uh, action. Special temporal action detection is uh, similar uh, in a similar uh, things, but different approach because uh, take into account uh, also the localization and also the type of many different action that can be detected in the same place. So it's a detection and not classification. And the third, uh, um, and the third problem, uh, very connected with this, uh, is temporal action localization. So this defining the first uh, and uh, the last frame uh, where the action is carried out. Uh, these are three very famous uh, data set, uh, kinetics, ABA, and then Thumos. So Thumos is older, uh, that take into account uh, these kind of things. Of course, if you want, you can uh, stop with me or you can do the question at the end. Uh, how do you prefer? About kinetics, uh, I'm sure that most of you are aware of that. Uh, kinetics is evolving year by year. Started with the Kinetic 400 data set uh, um, some years ago in the group of uh, Zisserman. But now there is Kinetics 600, now Kinetics uh, 700, so also together with AVA. So it's uh, created a new, uh, also new data set, but uh, is uh, the one that, that uh, I'm using uh, in this presentation and probably is one of the most complete uh, um, action data set where we, we can work on. Uh, how many approaches we can have in uh, uh, action classification? So many. Uh, pure 2D approaches, so just only using uh, frames without the time, are something that uh, from one side can be used just only as a baseline, like uh, X2D used in a baseline in uh, this uh, last uh, X3D work uh, uh, on Feichtenhofen uh, in uh, CVPR 2020. That is a really a very interesting paper to look at. And, uh, uh, but in general, most of the approaches now use uh, special temporal approaches all together with the 3D approaches uh, or with the two stages approaches, for instance, with the spatial RGB and optical flow in one other side or mixed approaches. Now, I don't want to, to do um, just an analysis of the improvement of that. Uh, because uh, this is not the topic of my talk, uh, since I will work uh, with the slow fast or with uh, some uh, neural network uh, that uh, have been uh, the uh, state of the art until last year. Uh, just to tell you now, there is a movie net uh, 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 architecture that is uh, the, the new state of the art in terms of accuracy in uh, kinetics uh, and uh, is actually a family of network because uh, this is mainly um, a paper on NAS, uh, so they found the best architecture according to some uh, parameters. But uh, I, I cited it because it's very similar to what I'm, I'm talking now. What I'm talking now, that uh, until now, in general, people discuss about accuracy, about robustness, about uh, 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 precision and recall and so on. But I believe that now we are in the time that also other two important issues should be taken into account. The first is the sustainability uh, and the second uh, is a privacy issue. Uh, I will talk uh, more uh, on the second point, uh, but uh, I will also uh, have a bit of time to discuss about the first. What I think about the sustainability or sustainability versus uh, uh, accuracy. 
When I say the term sustainability, I think about the amount of energy that we have to spend. And therefore, this is proportional of the complexity of the network or the number of gigaflops or megaflops that we have to lose. This is a very simple example. Uh, using a, a simple uh, K2D that reaching just only the 47% of top one accuracy, so is not performing so well, but is a required just only 20 megaflops uh, on GPU. Instead, the slow fast network uh, uh, that uh, uh, reaches 78.9% of 20, uh, top one accuracy is going more uh, 10,000 uh, um, larger network with respect to, to the use of gigaflop. So, so probably we understand that there is an evident redundancy in some architectural choice. And uh, the idea end is how can we uh, maximize uh, this uh, ratio between uh, the good accuracy, but also good, uh, um, uh, um, good use of the GPU. Uh, the, the network that I showed you before, so this uh, movie nets uh, is something that is going in this direction because movie nets uh, propose uh, recently uh, the use of NAS in order to find uh, the best uh, trade off in order to, um, to gain uh, in, uh, in energy and also in accuracy. We are doing the same uh, uh, working with NVIDIA with uh, the, the idea to start uh, with um, something that we can do with a single uh, V100 GPU and to go in a direction of something that can be integrated uh, in a Jetson Nano or in some embedding AI. So in a very, very simple manner in order to do this kind of things. And what I'm uh, presenting now is an approach, is an automatic approach uh, in order to reduce uh, dramatically the use, uh, the, the dimension of the network, but at the same time, uh, take uh, the uh, high the accuracy. Um, this is something that is related to a standard approach of optimization. And the basic idea is that instead of to try to reduce everything together, like we can do with the NAS, for instance, we try to reduce one architectural hyperparameter at a time. So we define the find, uh, five type of hyperparameters that can be improved, the special resolution of the input, the temporal length of the input, the frame rate of the of the clip, so using the stride in the time, temporal stride or not, the number of output channel in the network, and also the number of layer. So the, the idea is how can we um, try to improve, to optimize this number in order to keep uh, as possible uh, the high um, accuracy of uh, uh, the, the system. So uh, uh, now we, what we, we are doing now, this uh, work is not finished at all. We, are, uh, we are already presented them uh, two weeks ago at uh, GTC uh, for NVIDIA but it's something that is still not published, uh, is uh, a, a part of, uh, with NVIDIA, is to use what we call the, a progressive architecture shrinkage. That means that uh, we try to modify just only one hyperparameter by chance, and uh, with the approach of using knowledge distillation. Uh, in uh, which manner? So the algorithm uh, at the end is very simple because the other the, is an iterative method that uh, uh, for the first time we try to a number of reduced network with uh, knowledge distillation actually uh, uh, trying to, to work in the five different space dimension then assuming that uh, all the axes did the same uh, lower complexities in constant factor we we try to find in which manner we can maximize accuracy and then uh, we go to the iteration Probably you can see better um, in these images or probably, so we use the, the concept of knowledge distillation. So that means that each network is smallest network is trained 
with uh, um, annotated data, so in a supervised method, but also using uh, the Kubeliber function, also the information coming uh, from the teaching network. Uh, the teacher network is the biggest one that you have at the beginning. Um, I don't um, have too much time to spend uh, for uh, for all the detail of the implementation, but you can find that the algorithm is simple. Uh, starting from the big network, you try to do uh, five different uh, the student network with the one parameter optimized, then you choose the best one and use this one as a teacher for fine tuning and going to another improvement and another improvement. Um, what I say, this is a good idea, but as a big drawback, because in order to find the good solution, we had to use an enormous amount of computational power. Uh, in Italy, we are lucky because uh, these are uh, Marconi, Marconi 100, uh, the DGX uh, with the uh, A100 that is in Cineca, and the next Leonardo in um, at the end of this year will be an enormous amount uh, of um, of resources that uh, are available. I, I, I presented that because this is uh, available for all of us because this is available for all Europe. It's just enough to do it to use them and uh, and we actually stressed them this is an, a first example of what we did mm, we consider two network for uh, two network for action analysis the first uh, simplest one uh, this uh, has been presented as CVPR two years ago is the one from Yale Canto Rezami and the other one is this uh, two plus one D convolution and um, the second one is a slow fast. Uh, that slow fast instead is a double network that have one part that use a high frame rate and the other one that is already create a low frame rate. So uh, do a temporal skipping in order to find uh, some of them. Performance uh, was more or less the same, about 70% uh, the top one accuracy for the R2 um, plus 1D, 73% uh, for the second. And uh, with um, a big amount of gigaflops uh, using of that. And these are the results uh, we achieved uh, using uh, this kind of optimization. That from one side are interesting because it's a, a classical optimization that uh, we, we spend many, many uh, time, uh, human time uh, and uh, GPU time in order to do this kind of optimization. But the result, uh, from my point of view, are uh, really interesting. Because what does it mean? That uh, if you're looking to find an action, for instance, is in top five. Top five is a good uh, trade-off. Uh, and you start with a big network where you, you achieve the 88% of accuracy with the top five. You have a drop uh, until just only 87%, so nothing, just only one per, uh, one. Uh, uh, mm, one degree or one percent of uh, of decrease in accuracy, but you divide by four the amount uh, of the use of GPU and the amount of the use of of, uh, of memory. Similar things uh, with the slow fast, uh, and similarly we are looking for also new network uh, because. Uh, I think that this is an idea that you have to do, not when you have to present just only one paper, but when you think that uh, this uh, kind of architecture can be used in real time uh, in, uh, in a real situation, which is the drawback of what I showed you. Uh, the drawback is the, this number. Uh, in order to do all the tests, uh, in order to understand that uh, this approach was good and the other one was less, uh, and we compare them also with uh, uh, the other method, uh, and we did all the ablation studied, uh, we spent something like uh, uh, six, uh, four thousand uh, GPU hours, so more or less uh, seven years using a single uh, GPU. So that idea is that, okay, uh, if you use brute force reduction, you can achieve a sustainability, but absolutely not a sustainable way. 
But if you do that at the end, uh, you can do it in a reproducible way and uh, probably you can accept to lose a bit of accuracy in order to save the planet. So this was my first message that I would like to share with you. Now, uh, the second message um, that I prefer because it's something that is a, a new direction that really we have to cope in, uh, in Europe uh, is the idea that we have uh, to still to think about uh, privacy preserving. Uh, privacy preserving uh, is something uh, we did in computer vision in multimedia. Uh, people uh, as my lab, uh, the lab in Trento and many other worked uh, in uh, this topic uh, since many, many years. But uh, we know that uh, until now we had just only GP GDPR regulation uh, in Europe. But now we have uh, this uh, new regulation that probably you know that has been presented the last week uh, in Brussels that take into account uh, the difference between what is called the high risk uh, and what is called the not high risk. Um, there are 80 pages uh, of legal text, so it's not, uh, from my point of view, is also a bit boring, but it's very important, is that now the European Commission has a specific objective to ensure that the AI system placed on the union market that they use it are safe and respect existing law of fundamental rights of union values. What does it mean? It means that uh, since security and privacy preserving is one of the most important fundamental rights, if in the future we would like to use this kind of system in Europe, we should have, uh, we will have a sort of, of uh, 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 European uh, uh, mark, uh, CA mark on that. This is something that we have to discuss because uh, if you look at the annex number three, where there are uh, uh, the system that are considered the high risky, there are five category of high risky system. And the first of this category is biometric identification and categorization of natural person. So everything that is connected with images, a video of people or similar things uh, can be considered high risky if uh, they have a biometric identification of the natural person. So this is the reason now I think that uh, uh, the, the study of something about privacy preserving uh, is very, very important. And it's so important that uh, uh, people started to study some data set uh, uh, oriented uh, to anonymized uh, data. For instance, this is the first data set that has been presented the last year in, uh, in RIPS. It is called the AVID data set that is an anonymized video with the, uh, from diverse countries. Uh, for instance, this is an example of greeting uh, in Japan, uh, in Italy, uh, in, uh, or in Europe, in Maori, in Asia, just to say that also the action uh, is different also according to different cultures and not only with the different people. So the question that we are asking uh, together in the last month is here in Modena is, uh, uh, but if you want to, to recognize uh, an action, do you need to have the face? Or second, more important question, do you need to have the shape of the person precisely? So do you have uh, all the information about the dress, about uh, the detail uh, of the shape or just enough to have a rough idea of the shape and the contest is important. So this is an example of one class that is accurate where you can see that sometimes it's more complex because this is another class in kinetics 400 that is arm wrestling where of course, first there are not just only one person and second, the person are mixed together and so probably it's more complex to understand the scene also for us if we don't see the people in a very precise manner. But so our question is how can you do in order to deal with images like this one and or with data like this one but working in a very precise manner. So the, the flow we think about is that one in the future probably we will have uh, online um, acquisition or data set 
that can be anonymized, uh, anonymized, uh, for instance, as we do, just uh, to um, detect uh, and, uh, uh, and obscure the face. We use uh, just, for example, dual shot face detector, that is a good face detector state of the art, or we use a mask uh, uh, RCNN in order to mask uh, the, um, that is an instant segmentation in order to mask uh, the, um, the person. So our question is, can we achieve good result in actual recognition having this information or probably also having some information from the beginning? Consider how much is important to do that. Uh, these are some numbers that take into account how much is important. For instance, uh, if you think uh, kinetics uh, for under data set uh, of action analysis, uh, uh, the 90th, uh, the 93% of the video, uh, sorry, the, all the videos, all 400 video contained for the 93% of the time a person. So, of course, if you have to detect an action, people or many people are important. And so you can say how many people are there. Sometimes instead you don't have the face because uh, these are an example, the same that, uh, for instance, just only in 150 uh, uh, type of categories, uh, you have the 90% of uh, faces, uh, but in many other you don't, uh, you don't have, uh, you, you don't need uh, the face. Uh, this is another example of measure that we did that they say that uh, at the same time, the use of uh, faces uh, and bodies uh, is uh, really, uh, very frequent. Uh, uh, most of the frame uh, have one or more body. So what we did? Again, uh, we try to use the same principle uh, we, we presented before. So we are working in knowledge distillation and this is something we are trying to think. So what does it mean? Uh, we try to use a teacher model with uh, privileged uh, information. That means uh, that uh, we have three different, uh, we have two different input. We have the input X, uh, the input X, uh, and the input uh, X star. Uh, X star and some uh, privileged information. So, have, for instance, the face, the face instead, uh, X is not the face. But you have the couple of the video with the face or without the face and you want to detect and to classify the action uh, eating, for instance, in this case, in order to do that. So the, the first uh, approach that is not uh, actually fair because you, you have information about face in one's time is uh, to teach uh, a, a basic model with original data and to pass uh, in, uh, in um, in a student, uh, just only uh, information without the face, the ground through labels, and also some information coming from the teacher, but already anonymized. Actually, I would like to propose you three different uh, approaches. Uh, this um, this uh, kind of things uh, we send that uh, has been accepted to the workshop, one of the workshop of CVPR, because it's a very recent uh, result. So uh, we will present uh, this uh, initial result uh, in two months. We, we try to, 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 to study three different uh, uh, situations. The first is, uh, as in the other paper I presented, using a data set with just anonymized data. So using directly anonymized data and stop. The second, uh, instead, is uh, uh, use uh, a teaching student mechanism, uh, but with the, the teacher uh, trained with not anonymized data and the student instead with the data that has been obscured. And the third, using a, a, a newer math, uh, method of knowledge distillation that is uh, re using transfer also the relation of the teacher. So working a, a mini batch level, not only a single uh, frame level in order to, to pass not only the information of a single frame, but information of also the similarity between the, fra the frame of the clips on the same class. 
So the first method, as I told you, is just to uh, use a simple method. Uh, if you work on uh, obfuscated data, that is interesting because uh, uh, in the, this case, you understand that you have information of body, probably obfuscated, but you keep the information about the motion and about the context. And uh, this data are really very important for action analysis and so sometimes are good enough. Second method. Second method, uh, as I told you, uh, we uh, we use a, a teaching student method. Here I have uh, some uh, uh, information uh, really uh, at, uh, about uh, what we use. Of course, you can find in the paper that is already on archive. But uh, just uh, to tell you, because at the end uh, is uh, um, is simple. The the teacher has been trained uh, with uh, classical uh, cross entropy with a soft mass uh, operator that take into account uh, uh, the distance between the label and uh, the frame, the keyframe, uh, with all the information about the face and about the body. Instead, uh, the uh, the student uh, network uh, uh, is trained uh, with a composed uh, with um, a loss that they take into account. Uh, you, you can see here, you can take into account uh, the standard loss, uh, but also the Kuber-Lieber difference uh, with respect uh, to the information that come uh, from the teaching. So it's a classical uh, uh, knowledge distillation method uh, that uh, is uh, used. Instead, uh, we also trained uh, the new approach proposed two years ago about uh, relational knowledge distillation that take into account, as I told you, not only the uh, this distance uh, between uh, a single uh, pair of uh, clip uh, and action, but also the pairwire distance between logic that are preserved the transferring the knowledge in the other side. Uh, in this case, uh, the loss uh, is composed by three different terms because there is also a third term that takes into account the relational distillation between a mini batch of that. Okay, we tried that again uh, on two different uh, network of classification. The first is uh, the REST net uh, 2 plus 1, or also the NEST, uh, REST uh, 3D, and the second uh, slow fast uh, network with uh, some batch size of uh, one uh, and a half uh, thousand uh, of clips and 2,000 uh, 2, of clips uh, in the second side. But I believe that what is important to discuss with you in this last one minutes are really the result. Because what you can say that the, the, in the result, in the result that you see that if you obscure the face or absolutely you obscure the full body, of course, you have a good, a big drop of performance. It's about a 3% in one case and 18% in the second case. But if you use knowledge distillation, first, you have an improvement. Also, this, this line say that you improved just only with knowledge distillation. That has been tested also in many other cases that knowledge distillation is useful. So we improved without any information, just only working on anonymized data. But again, if you use the obscuration with knowledge distillation, you achieve a fantastic result because more or less in less than one, uh, not 18%, but just only 2.8% of drop down uh, uh, using uh, uh, this kind of distillation. Similar things, uh, uh, if you want to use another backbone, we are to try and, and what we are discussing now is also um, where there are the, diff the, the distance and where there is the best category uh, that uh, uh, are affected by distillation and uh, anonymization. Just to give the last example, of course, uh, uh, if you are testing beer, uh, this, uh, the action of testing beer doesn't take a lot into account the body, but uh, the problem is the face. Instead, if you're playing harmonic or doing other things, uh, also the body is important uh, or in other things. Okay, I'm stopping because my time uh, is over and I uh, and absolutely I would like to thank uh, Matteo Tomei because this uh, 
two work are part of uh, the, the Matteo Tomei PhD work, also together with uh, NVIDIA and also together with uh, MetaLiquid. And I also I would like to thank uh, Lorenzo Baraldi that uh, is uh, the big brain of everything of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. And now it's time for questions. Probably it's time to go to eat for everyone, <laughs> not the time for a question. Yeah, this is also true. <laughs> okay, so I have just one question, but just an additional thing. So how do you find using only skeleton data with respect to privacy preserving action? Understanding? Yeah, 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 uh, uh, perfect things. Uh, this is the third thing uh, we are doing now. Uh, actually, you already tested that, uh, but uh, for action analysis uh, is imp more important to have sometimes uh, the, the dimension of the body and not just only the, uh, mm -hmm. the key point. So we are doing uh, many uh, test uh, with um, uh, with pose estimator with open uh, pose and many other one but the results are better using eastern segmentation in this one but this is a uh, there is no theory inside of that it's just mm -hmm. only uh, i say in uh, this kind of uh, of application but since uh, my next step uh, is to do that uh, not only in kinetics but for specific problem uh, like for instance uh, for uh, uh, urban uh, environment or in specific environment. So when the number of action are less, less generic, uh, and you have to classify better with a better, um, with a best recall, probably uh, key points are very useful. Thank you. So thank you very much again for the very insightful and informative talk. And thank you for joining us. And actually, your talk uh, concludes the workshop as well. So I would like to thank everybody joining us today. This was this is the end of the AI for Media workshop on new learning paradigms and distributed AI. And we hope to meet with you in the next workshops of AI for Media. Have a good day. Have a good lunch. <laughs>